Welcome to the Machine Learning with Python course, where our goal is to make the machine learning coding experience easy to learn for people from every walks of life. Our focus throughout the course will be to teach you the in-demand machine learning skills using the Python platform for coding through hands-on lab exercises. We will use Jupyter Notebook coding environment which is easy to use and very functional. We have enhanced the learning experience by explaining key concepts visually. We will have a capstone project at the end of the course that will let you learn all the concepts in one place and in one go. Quizzes are designed to test the student's learning of key concepts. Meet our team who played a role in researching, designing and creating this course. Together we have close to 30 years of experience in practical implementation of technology and teaching technical courses at a university level. Our team members have specialization in areas of information technology, software engineering, data sciences and design. We will have a total of 10 sections that are designed to help the students learn progressively. We will start from the basic introduction of the course and gradually move to the intermediate concepts. By the end of these lessons, you will be able to start coding in Python for your projects for machine learning. Key concepts are explained visually to enable our students grasp the technical concepts quickly and effectively. The Jupyter Notebook is an open source coding environment. Some of the key benefits are easy to use graphic user interface, text annotated in the markdown syntax to give you more insights into the code, you can generate graphics and charts easily, interactive code and data exploration, and lastly, easy coding exercises. Our capstone project will help you understand the overall steps which should be followed in order to achieve the desired predicted results, implementing all the concepts taught in this course. In this present world, machine learning is rooted to almost all the fields of life related to a common man and so comes the role of its importance to study and learn the key concepts. Here are some of the companies requiring machine learning skills to fuel their day-to-day -day operations and critical software development needs. We look forward to having you join our course and we promise that this course will help you build your foundational coding skills in machine learning that will help you make your resume stand out and demand a competitive salary in the marketplace. Hi and welcome to lecture 1 of Python Machine Learning. Before we move on to machine learning, I have a question for you. How could you tell apples and oranges apart? That's right, we can tell both apart by their physical appearance, shape, texture, color, size and even taste. All these traits are called features. When we see a person or an object, we subconsciously observe their features and tell them apart. But the question remains, how can a computer perform such tasks? The answer to this question is through machine learning. So let us see what actually is machine learning. After seeing a person or an object, our brain automatically feeds in the feature of that particular thing or person. So in future we know who is who and what is what. But in terms of computers, to do so, we provide them with a feature set, which is also referred to as an observation and along with that, we give them labels for each object so that they can perform machine learning algorithms on the provided input and train themselves to make future predictions, learn from that data and improve throughout the process. Let's see the phenomena discussed diagrammatically. Over here you can see that some data and labels are being supplied to the machine learning algorithm. As a result, a machine learning model is being trained. After training the model, test data is provided to the model. In this case, you can see that two shapes 
are supplied as test data to make further predictions. But over here, the labels are not provided. The model predicts what type of shape are these and give the predicted output. All of this is a summarized machine learning procedure and we are going to discuss this in detail throughout the course. Hi and welcome to the second lecture video of our course. In this video, we are going to discuss the traditional programming approach versus the machine learning approach. Let's begin by discussing the traditional programming approach first. There are three basic steps when it comes to the workflow of a traditional programming approach. In step number one, the software engineer begins by developing an algorithm to solve the problem at hand. In the second step, after devising the logic of an algorithm, he or she continues with the implementation of the algorithm, which is in terms of coding. And lastly, in the third step, their implemented algorithm is used in order to gain the desired results. Let's see the machine learning approach that is being used. The primary step in the machine learning approach is the data collection and its preparation. As you can see in step number one, some external sources, such as in this case a database or a spreadsheet, that is used in order to collect the data. This data is again prepared for further use and we are going to see this step in detail in the coming course. So after the appropriate data is gathered in step number one, the next step for a data engineer is to experiment with the existing machine learning, learning algorithms for building a better machine learning model. This model is later used in order to get the predicted outcome when provided by the test data. Now let's compare both of the approaches. We're going to first compare them diagrammatically. So as you can see over here, we can spot the differences amongst the two images one being the traditional programming approach and the other being the machine learning approach. So there is only one output for the traditional programming that too is in the form of processed data whereas in the case of machine learning we get the output in terms of a model. This model is later on used in order to make the predictions to retrieve the predicted outcome. Lastly, let's chalk out the differences amongst both the approaches here. So number one, the rules and data are input when we talk about the traditional approach, as opposed to which we have labeled data as input in the machine learning approach. Number two, the output is processed data for a traditional approach, and we get a trained model as an outcome of a machine learning approach that is later used to make the predictions. Point number three. The software engineer codes and or implements the algorithm, whereas a data engineer experiments with the existing algorithms to achieve the desired goals, which in this case is a model. Hi and welcome to lecture 3 of Python machine learning. We have already seen the basic concept and steps which are involved in machine learning. Now we are going to explore its process flow. There are six main steps involved in machine learning. It is an iterative process. Beginning with the first step, we are going to discuss each step in detail. Very first being data collection. The process of gathering data depends on the type of project we desire to make. The data set can be collected from various sources such as a file, database, sensor and many other such sources. This step is very important because the quantity and quality of data that you gather will directly determine how good your predictive model can be. Next, data cleaning. The collected data cannot be used directly for performing the analysis process as there might be a lot of missing data, extremely large values, unorganized text data or noisy data. That's where data cleaning and transforming comes in. In this step, we load our data into a suitable place and prepare it for use in our machine learning training. Some of the tasks performed in this step are handling missing values, adding aggregate columns, removing duplicate and unwanted data, and changing data types of columns, etc. Next, data visualization. 
to help us see if there are any relevant relationships between different variables, we can take advantage of data visualizations. This shows us if there are any data imbalances as well. For instance, if we collected way more data points about apples than oranges, the model we train will be biased towards guessing that virtually everything that it sees is apple, since it would be right most of the time. This is called data imbalance, and data visualization techniques can be used in order to review this process. After data visualization, we have model selection process. The next step in our workflow is choosing a model. The model identifies trends and patterns in the data that is input to any machine learning algorithm. Our main goal is to train the best performing model possible using the pre-processed data. And lastly, we evaluate and deploy. Once training is complete, it's time to see if the model is any good. This is done using evaluation. Evaluation allows us to test our model against data that has never been used for training. This metric allows us to see how the model might perform against data that it has not seen yet. And lastly, we deploy the machine learning model, which is integration of the model in the existing work environment. Up till now, we have talked about the theoretical concepts of machine learning, but in order to relate to it, we must see where machine learning exists in our daily lives. Facebook has a huge role to play in socially connecting us with one another. Facebook helps you connect and share with people in your life. Facebook uses machine learning algorithms that rank feeds, ads, and search results and create new text understanding algorithms that keep spam and misleading content at bay. Amazon has made our lives easier as it has enabled us to shop at home. Amazon suggests new items or products you might find of interest on the basis of your buying patterns. Similarly, Netflix suggests movies and series on the basis of your video watching trend all of this is thanks to machine learning. Looking again into Amazon and some of more features possible due to machine learning involve not only product suggestion but customer segmentation based on their purchasing behavior and variation of product price on the basis of its demands. The gaming industry has evolved a great deal, all thanks to machine learning and artificial intelligence. We now have the facility of virtually experiencing the gaming environment due to VR glasses. Not only that, but physical activities at home is possible due to gesture game control provided by Nintendo. The last practical example that I'm going to discuss is of Uber. Uber has made our lives easier and machine learning has made it possible. Features such as suggesting shortest route, suggestions for drop and pickup points, finding customers traveling in similar routes and predicting fares based on route and time of booking is because of machine learning. Up till now, we have been familiarized with the concept of machine learning. Now the next step is to know its types. As we have different types and forms of input data, so there exist three types of machine learning to train the model according to the data. We will see the basic concept behind each type in this module. The very first and most popular, supervised learning. In supervised learning, we have labeled input data which is used to train our model. Contrary to which, there is no labeled data in unsupervised learning. And as for reinforcement learning, the machine learns on its own to achieve the desired goal. Let's see how all of the above can be achieved. Starting with supervised learning. This mode of learning mimics the use of flashcards for demonstration. The picture in flashcards are labeled with the name of the object image on it. Showing this to anyone would be training them. After training a person with labeled cards, now if we show him or her with an unlabeled card, he or she could name the object on their own. This is what we do in supervised learning with the machine. Circling back to the example that we discussed earlier of apples and oranges. 
Labeled training data is supplied to a supervised learning algorithm which helps in the prediction of an unexpected data. In this case, the training data is similar to a teacher or a supervisor that trains the model. The outcome of the model is based on previous experiences. Due to this, supervised learning is known to be task-oriented. By training the model on more examples, it becomes more accurate than before. There are two main types of supervised learning, the very first being classification. As the name suggests, the result of a classification problem is a category. For instance, true or false, on or off, there could be two or more discrete categorical responses to a classification problem. As evident in the image on this slide, the response to the classification problem is in terms of a category that is either cold or hot which is also an answer regarding the temperature, but in categorical terms. There are two types of classification. The first is the binary class in which there are only two class labels. Example, a male is either spam or not. Whereas in a multi-class problem, there can be more than two classes. For instance, the weather might be sunny, rainy, cloudy or windy. Now let us see some of the examples of classification problem. Number one, spam filtering in which the male can either be spam or not spam. In disease prediction problem where a patient can either be diagnosed with a disease or not. Similarly, in weather prediction, the weather could either be hot, cold or rainy, etc. In a house loan prediction problem, the house loan is either approved or not approved. The other type of supervised learning is regression. In a regression problem, you have an outcome in the form of a continuous value rather than a discrete category. As you can see in the image over here, the response to a regression problem is 84 Fahrenheit, as opposed to the response that we previously had in the classification problem as hot or cold. The response to a regression problem is a continuous value which tells us about the temperature tomorrow. In a regression problem, the response or the prediction that we want to make is called a dependent variable, whereas the factors or the values that help us predict the response are called the predictors and are the independent variables. Moving on towards the examples of regression, predicting house prices, predicting car prices and prediction of body weight are some examples of the regression problem. The answer to all of these are in terms of continuous values. We have previously discussed that unlike supervised learning, in unsupervised learning, there is no label training data. Now we are going to look into it in a bit more detail. This form of machine learning is data driven as it is based on the properties of data. The trained model needs to find out patterns in the data and give the respective outcome according to what it has learned from it. The most famous example of unsupervised learning is a recommender system. People who have used YouTube and or Netflix are familiar with unsupervised learning and deal with it on a daily basis. As in both, the algorithm recommends you a new video or movie based on your previously watched videos or movie pattern. As evident from the image, you can see that in an unsupervised learning, now we are sending the input data but here the labels are missing. All of this information goes into the model, where the model recognizes the pattern of the data and gives us the output. Over here, the output is in the form of clusters, which brings us to the type of unsupervised learning. The very famous type of unsupervised learning is clustering. Clustering is a type of unsupervised machine learning problem where data is grouped based on the similarities amongst them. The formation of clusters is not based on the labels. The clustering algorithm finds similar patterns that may exist within data points according to which they are clustered. Apparently in the image, there are different images to be clustered and you can see that the result we get after some clustering algorithm is applied are three cluster. One with the images of birds, second is the images of fish and the last one is the images of mammals. Now let's come to the examples of clustering. This is also 
used in finding patterns in the data. For example, customers can be grouped on the basis of their purchasing behavior, detection of fraudulent transactions based on unusual transactional behavior, customer churn prediction based on customer behavior. The last type up for discussion is reinforcement learning. This type of learning is based on trial and error. The model learns from its action and the feedback that it gets from its actions. There are rewards and punishments to dictate the good and bad behavior in this type. Let's look at the image up on the slide. For instance, we provide an apple as an input to the algorithm. The response to the input is not correct in the first attempt. So we provide the algorithm with our feedback. The algorithm learns from the feedback and corrects its response. Summarizing our discussion, we can say that reinforcement learning is goal-based. Let's look into further working details of reinforcement learning. Suppose we need to teach a child how to walk. Firstly, he notices and tries to replicate people walking. Before walking, he realizes he needs to stand. The next challenge is to remain standing still. And finally, the most difficult part is taking steps. How is this similar to reinforcement learning? If we translate our example to reinforcement learning, then we can say that the problem statement at hand is how to walk. The child in our case is the agent that has to learn this phenomena. And he is going to learn this from his environment, that is by noticing people around him. The action that the child takes is walking and each step that he takes is a new state for him. For taking each step that is achieving a subtask, he gets a reward. That could be in a form of a treat. And if he fails to take another step or go from one state to another, he does not get any treat as a punishment. This is reinforcement learning in simplified terms. Let's see the technical definition for each term. If we translate our example to reinforcement learning, then we can say that the problem statement at hand is how to walk. The child in our case is the agent that has to learn this phenomena. And he is going to learn this from his environment, that is by noticing people around him. The action that the child takes is walking. And each step that he takes is a new state for him. For taking each step that is achieving a subtask, he gets a reward that could be in the form of a treat. And if he fails to take another step or go from one state to another, he does not get any treat as a punishment. So this is all of the process in simplified terms. We are going to discuss some important terminology related to reinforcement learning now. A reinforcement learning problem can be best explained through games. First comes the agent. An agent is an entity that performs the action. Let's take the game of Pac-Man where the goal of the agent, which is Pac-Man, is to eat the food in the grid while avoiding the ghosts on its way. Next comes the environment. Now the environment is the scenario which is faced by the agent. The grid world is the interactive environment for the agent. The reward is the result for the positive behavior of the agent. Pac-Man receives a reward for eating food and punishment if it gets killed by the ghost and loses the game. Lastly, the state is the current situation of the agent in the environment. The states are the location of Pac-Man in the grid world and the total cumulative reward is Pac-Man winning the game. Two kinds of reinforcement learning methods are there. The very first is positive. It is defined as an event that occurs because of specific behavior. It increases the strength and the frequency of the behavior and impacts positively on the action taken by the agent. The other is negative. Negative reinforcement is defined as the strengthening of behavior that occurs because of a negative condition which should have stopped or avoided. It helps you to define the minimum standards of performance. Lastly, let's discuss the examples of reinforcement learning. The real-life implementations for reinforcement learning are game theory, robotics, GPS, and industrial logistics. Deep learning is the most exciting and powerful branch of machine learning. It's a technique that teaches computers to do what comes naturally to humans. Learn by example. 
Artificial Neural Networks or ANN is an information processing paradigm that is inspired by the way biological nervous system such as brain process information. Neural networks are at the forefront of machine learning. They are being trained to perform a variety of tasks imaginable. The brain is a critical component in our body that enables learning. It has about 10 billion interconnected neurons. A neuron receives input from other neurons. Sum of input happens and when the sum exceeds a particular threshold, the neuron sends an electrical spike to another neuron through the exon. Neural networks can usually be read from left to right. As here you can see, the first layer is the layer in which the inputs are entered. There is one internal layer in this example which is called the hidden layer that to do some math and one last layer that contains all the possible outputs which is known as the output layer. This is the basic structure of a simple neural network. The operations done by each neuron are pretty simple. First, it adds up the value of every neuron from the previous column it is connected to. This value is multiplied before being added by another variable which is called the weight, which determines the connection between the two neurons. Each connection of neurons has its own weight and those are the only values that will be modified during the learning process. Moreover, a bias value may be added to the total value calculated. It is not a value coming from a specific neuron and is chosen before the learning phase but can be useful for the network. After all those summations, the neuron finally applies a function which is called the activation function to the obtained value. The activation function usually serves to turn the total value calculated before to a number between 0 and 1. Now let's have a look at major applications of ANN. The very first, handwriting recognition. The ability of the computer that allows it to receive and interpret handwritten input that can be from sources such as photographs and documents, etc. Neural networks are used to recognize handwritten characters. Second, image compression. The cost of storage and transmission of images can be reduced by image compression. With the internet explosion and more sites using more images on their sites, using neural network for image compression is a worthy application of ANN. Next, text to speech. Another eminent application of ANN is conversion of written text to speech. This is very important to aid visually impaired users. And last but not the least, stock exchange prediction. The day-to-day -day business of stock exchange market is very complicated. Many factors weigh in whether a given stock will go up or down on any given day. Thus, neural networks can examine a lot of information in a fast manner and sort it all out so we can use them to predict stock prices. In this module, our agenda is to discuss the eminent algorithms in each type of machine learning that we previously discussed. We are going to start off with algorithms belonging to supervised learning. The most popular algorithm of supervised learning is linear regression. Before we dive into the regression algorithm, let's know the basics of regression. Regression models a target prediction value based on independent variables. It is mostly used for finding out the relationship between variables in forecasting. Different regression models differ based on the kind of relationship between dependent and independent variables they are considering and the number of independent variables being used. Quick question. Which of the following might be a regression problem? Correct. Prediction of increase in percentage sales is a regression problem as the output prediction or response in this case is a continuous value. There are six primary types of regression models. Simple linear regression, polynomial regression, support vector regression, decision tree regression, random forest regression, and lastly, logistic regression. We will be discussing simple linear regression, logistic regression, and decision tree regression. 
Linear regression performs the task to predict a dependent variable value, which is y, based on a given independent variable, say x. So this regression technique finds out a linear relationship between x, which is the input, and y, the output. Hence the name is linear regression. In the diagram you can see the line of regression that is found using this algorithm. I am sure you are curious of how we find this line. So let's get to it. This equation is how we find the best fit line of regression for our model. Let's see each variable involved in this equation. While training the model, we are given number 1, x, which is our input training data. In univariate case, it is one input variable parameter. Y is the labels to the data which are used in supervised learning. When training the model, it fits the best line to predict the value of y for a given value of x. The model gets the best regression fit line by finding the best B0 and B1 values. B0 is the intercept and B1 is the coefficient of x, also referred as a slope. And E is the error of prediction. Once we find the best B0 and B1 values, we get the best fit line. So when we are finally using our model for prediction, it will predict the value of y for the input value of x. Here is an example of how we can calculate the predicted y points. In the last column x is replaced by its respective value which is in column 1. The values of b0 and b1 are updated to get the best fit line. But the question remains how? By achieving the best fit regression line, the model aims to predict y value such that the error difference between predicted value and the true value is minimum. So it is very important to update the b0 and b1 values. In order to reach the best value that minimizes the error between predicted y value and true y value. Moving on to logistic regression. Logistic regression is another technique borrowed by machine learning from the field of statistics. Logistic regression is a classification algorithm used to assign observations to a discrete set of classes. Some of the examples of classification problem are email spam or not spam, online transactions fraud or not fraud, tumor malignant or benign. Logistic regression transforms its output using the logistic sigmoid function to turn a probability value. There are three types of logistic regression, binary, multi and ordinal. Let's see them in a bit more detail. Number one, binary. Say we are given data on students' exam results and our goal is to predict whether a student will pass or fail based on the number of hours slept and hours spent studying. So here the answer would be either pass or fail, hence it's a binary problem of logistic regression. In multi-problem of logistic regression, instead of y is equals to 0 or 1, which is our predicted value, we will expand our definition so that y is equals to 0, 1, up till n, and n can be any number. Basically, we rerun binary classification multiple times, once for each class. Lastly, ordinal. In ordinal logistic regression, the variables are not only categorical, but they are also following an order, such as job satisfaction level. Are you dissatisfied, satisfied, or highly satisfied? Another example might be performance of an individual. Is it poor, fair, or excellent? In order to map the predicted values to probabilities, we use the sigmoid function. The function maps any real value into an other value between 0 and 1. We expect our classifiers to give us a set of outputs or classes based on probability when we pass the inputs through a prediction function and returns a probability score between 0 and 1. For example, we have two classes. Let's take them like apple and oranges. 1 for apple and 0 for oranges. We basically decide with the threshold value above which we classify values into class 1 
and if the value goes below the threshold value, then we classify it in class 2. As shown in the graph over here, we have chosen the threshold as 0 0.5. If the prediction function returned a value of 0 0.7, then we would classify this observation as class 1, which is apple. And if our prediction returned a value of 0 0.2, then we would classify the observation as class 2, say oranges. The nearest neighbors algorithm is a simple, easy to implement supervised machine learning algorithm that can be used to solve both classification and regression problems. Nearest neighbors algorithm uses feature similarity to predict the values of new data points, which further means that the new data point will be assigned a value based on how closely it matches the points in the training set. Suppose we have an image of a creature that looks similar to a cat and dog, but we want to know whether it is a cat or dog. So for this identification, we can use the KNN algorithm, also known as the K-nearest algorithm, as it works on similarity measure. Our KNN model will find the similar features of the new data set to the cat's and dog's images, and based on the most similar features, it will put it in either cat or dog category. Now suppose that there are two categories, that is category A and category B, and we have a new data point X1. So this data point will lie in which of these categories? To solve this type of problem, we need a KNN algorithm. With the help of KNN, we can easily identify the category or class of a particular data set. Consider the image in this slide. Do you remember studying the Pythagorean theorem? If you do, then you might remember calculating distance between two points using the theorem. Many of you must be wondering, do we even use this theorem in machine learning algorithms to find the distance? To answer your question, yes, we do use it. In machine learning algorithms, we use the above formula as a distance function. This is one of the many algorithms in which the distance matrix is used. Decision tree. In decision analysis, a decision tree can be used to visually and explicitly represent decisions and decision making. As the name goes, it uses a tree-like model of decisions. A decision tree is a flowchart-like structure in which each internal load represents a test on a feature. Example whether a coin flip comes heads or tails. Each leaf node represents a class label, decision taking after computing all the features and branches represent conjunction of features that lead to those class labels. The paths from root to leaf represent classification rules. Let's take an example of simple decision tree. The problem we are to address is, is the person fit or unfit? Now we start off with the root node where we check the age feature of a person, whether it is greater than or less than 30. In case of yes, we reach at an internal node which is eat pizza. And in case of no, we reach at an internal load, which is exercise. And then in case of eat pizza, the answer is either yes or no. And according to that, we determine whether a person is fit or unfit. Similarly, in the case of exercise, we also have two options, that is yes or no, according to which we reach at a particular conclusion. There are several approaches for decision-making tree, some of which are mentioned here. These approaches are used to decide which feature to split on at each step in building the tree. Knife base is a simple but surprisingly powerful algorithm to predict modeling. It is a classification technique based on the base theorem with an assumption of independence among predictors. In simple terms, a naive base classifier assumes that the presence of a particular feature in a class is unrelated to the presence of any other feature. For example, a fruit may be considered to be an apple if it is red, round, and about 3 inches in diameter. Even if these features depend on each other or upon the existence of the other features, all of these properties independently contribute to the probability that this fruit is apple, and that is why it is known as naive. Naive Bayes model is easy to build and particularly useful for very large data sets, 
along with simplicity. Naive Bayes is known to outperform even highly sophisticated classification methods. Now let's take a look into the formula in detail. Probability A given B is the conditional probability likelihood of event A such that B is given. Second probability B given A is the conditional probability that is likelihood of event B such that A is given. Probability of B is the marginal probability of event B and probability A is the marginal probability of event A. After discussing supervised learning, we are going to talk about unsupervised learning algorithms in this lecture. K-means is the first algorithm that strikes anyone's mind when talking about unsupervised learning. Clustering is arranged in a way that each observation in the same class possesses similar characteristics and observations of separate groups shows dissimilarity in characteristics. The K-means clustering algorithm assigns data points to categories or clusters by finding the mean distance between data points. It then iterates through this technique in order to perform more accurate classifications over time. Primarily, the concept would be in two steps. Firstly, the cluster center is the arithmetic mean of all the data points associated with the cluster. Secondly, each point is adjacent to its cluster center in comparison to other cluster centers. These two interpretations are the foundation of the k-means clustering algorithm. The word fuzzy means that the things are not clear or are vague. Sometimes we cannot decide in real life that the given problem or statement is either true or false. At that time, this concept provides many values between the true and false, gives the flexibility to find the best solution to that problem. As you can see on the screen, the question is that whether the water is hot or not. So in a straightforward approach, the answer to this question is yes or no. This is in terms of Boolean logic. But if we ask this question and we are not too sure about the answer, there could be a number of possibilities, such as very much, little or very less. This is known as fuzzy logic, when we are not too sure about the answer. In fuzzy clustering, points close to the center of a cluster may be in the cluster to a higher degree than a point in the edge of the cluster. The degree to which an element belongs to a given cluster is a numerical value varying from 0 to 1. The fuzzy C-mean, also known as FCM algorithm, is one of the most widely used fuzzy clustering algorithms. The centroid of a cluster is calculated as the mean of all points weighted by their degree of belonging to the cluster. The C-mean function contains the following important components. Number one is the centers, which is the final cluster center. Number two, size. It's the number of data points in each cluster of the closest hard clustering. Number three, cluster. A vector of integers containing the indices of the clusters where the data points are assigned to for the closest hard clustering, as obtained by assigning points to the first class with maximal membership. Then iteration. It's the number of iterations which are performed. Then membership, a matrix with the membership values of the data points to the clusters. And lastly, the error. It's the value of the objective function. As you can see in this diagram over here, we have four clusters in total. And you can see that each cluster has a particular shape that is associated to it. The blue cluster has circles, whereas the gray has squares, yellow has triangles, and the red one has plus sign into it. The size of the shape is the degree to which this point belongs to the cluster, and it is evident that the point at the center is the largest, that is because it has the greatest membership degree to this cluster. After discussing the two types of machine learning, now we have reached to type 3, which is reinforcement learning. The algorithm up for discussion is Q-learning. 
Q-learning is a basic form of reinforcement learning which uses Q values, also called action values, to iteratively improve the behavior of the learning agent. Q values are defined for states and actions. Q S, A is an estimation of how good it is to take the action A at the state S. This estimation will be iteratively computed using the TD, also known as Temporal Difference Update Rule. We will discuss this in the upcoming section. An agent over the course of its lifetime starts from the start state, makes a number of transitions from its current state to a next state based on its choice of action and also the environment the agent is interacting in. At every step of the transition, the agent from a state takes an action, observes a reward from the environment, and then transits to another state. If at any point of time the agent ends up in one of the terminating states, that means there is no further transition possible. This is said to be the completion of an episode. Now let's see the individual representations to the formula in the previous slide for temporal difference. Very first S represents the agent's current stage. Second A represents action taken by the agent in accordance to some policy. S dash represents the next stage of the agent and A dash represents the next action taken by the agent that has maximum Q value, also known as action value. R is the reward the agent gets in response to its action. Gamma ranging from 0 to 1 is the discounting factor for the future rewards. An alpha step length taken for the updation of QSA estimation. The greedy policy is a very simple policy of choosing actions using the current Q value estimations. Action having the highest Q value is chosen with probability 1 minus epsilon and any action at random is chosen with the probability of epsilon. I mentioned temporal difference earlier while explaining Q-learning, now let's deliberate about it. Temporal difference is an agent learning from an environment through episodes with no prior knowledge of the environment. This means temporal difference takes a model-free or unsupervised learning approach. You can consider it learning from trial and error. To understand this better, consider a real-life analogy. If Monte Carlo learning is like an annual examination where a student completes its episode at the end of the year. Similarly, we have temporal difference learning, also known as TD learning, which can be thought like a weekly or monthly examination. Students can adjust their performance based on this score. That is the reward they receive after every small interval and the final score is the accumulation of all weekly tests, that is the total reward. Hello everyone and welcome to module 4 of our course. In this module, we are going to install the Python environment on Windows, Linux and Mac operating system. Also, we are going to install Anaconda environment and lastly, we are going to run and save some Python scripts. Firstly, we need to open up our browser and open the Python official site. Now we're going to move towards the download button. It can install Python for different operating systems for Windows, Linux and Mac, but for now we're going to install it for Windows. I've installed the Python exe file and now I'm going to click on the launcher. Here you can see it. After clicking on add Python 3.8 to path, I'm going to click on install now and the setup will begin. So the setup is progressing for our Python and after it is done, we're going to launch the Python for Windows. Once we are done, just click on close and then we are going to open the command prompt. In the command prompt, we are going to type python space dash dash version and this will tell you the version of python that has been installed on your machine. After that, we are going to open the python interactive environment, just type python and here you can see we are in the python interactive environment but this is through command prompt. Now if I want some mathematical functions to be performed, let's say I type 34 plus 45 and click enter, you can see the result over here. Similarly, if I type 120 plus 45 divided by 34, press enter and now this is the result for it. Now let's launch Python idle. So just type idle or Python in the start menu and enter the first option that we get. 
So here is the Python interactive environment. This is the Python shell environment. And let's just type in some mathematical functions. For instance, 12 plus 78 into 453. Press enter. This is the result for it. Now let's just assign some numbers to the variables. Num1 is equals to 56. Press enter. And num2 is equals to 678. Press enter. Now if I want to print num1 plus num2, and then I will press enter and I will get the desired result for this. Do bracket close enter. Let's do another expression. Print num1 divided by num2 bracket close press enter. This is the output for it. If I want to open new file of Python, I want to save the script of Python for that. I need to click on file and then I'll click on new file. Here is my Python file. I can write my script over here, but I need to save it in order to run it. So let's just begin. I say num1 is equals to 45 and I say that num2 is equals to 456. Now let's just perform all of the mathematical operations onto it plus num1 plus num2, num1 minus num2, num1 minus num2. In order to save some time, I'm just going to copy this line and paste it two further times. And I'm going to change the sign to multiply and then to divide. Now I'm going to save my file. I'm going to click on file and then I'm going to click on the save button. Okay, here it is. And I'm going to give it the path where I want to save my Python file. So let's say I want to go to desktop. I'm going to name my file as my script. And then I am going to save my script. And now I'm going to click on the run option from the menu and run module. The shortcut for this is F5. And here is the output of my code. This is the entire output of my Python code that I've written. So you can see that expression one is the addition and here's the answer to that. The second is for subtraction and so on and so forth. So thank you for watching this video. Hello everyone. Today we're going to see how we can install the Python environment on our Linux operating system. So there are many ways to do that. But the easiest one is through terminal. So let's just search for the terminal. And press enter. Okay, so the first command we're going to see whether we have Python or not. So Python and then press enter. No, so we do not have Python, but the command is not found. So let's just type Python 3 and then press enter. So yes, we do have Python on the system. Uh, but if you don't, so don't worry. I'm just going to guide you through the entire process of how we can actually do it. So for that we do have a command but first let's just see some mathematical functions that we can do using Python. So it's 23 plus 23 I get 46 and 1 plus 45 divided by 56 into 89 press enter that's the result for it. So but what if we don't have this environment so we do need to install it so let's just see how we can get to it. So let's just type in sudo sudo apt update so this is for updating our software repository but uh, since it's updated for mine I'm just going to type in the installation command for this okay so it's sudo apt install python 3 and we're going to press enter after that but before I do that, I need to check whether do I have an idle or not. So let's just search for that. That do we contain um, an environment or not? Okay, so idle 3, I'm searching for it and no, I don't have that on my machine. So yes, I need to install idle 3 first. Okay, let's just kill it. Okay. sudo apt install idle Three. And now I'll press enter. It's asking me for a password. Just enter the password. And then after that, just press enter. It will start the installation procedure. And it's asking me whether I want to continue, Y or N. So yes, Y. 
press enter. Okay. Oh, I get an error over here, which says gateway timeout. So let's just fix this first. Idle three. Still not found. Let's just try reinstalling this. So before that, so sudo apt update. Just before installing, let's just update it first. So I'm updating it and let me just zoom in it for you. Okay, sudo apt install idle 3. After updating, I'm just installing idle 3 again. I'm going to press enter. Okay, so now you can see that the installation has begun. It's asking me whether I want to continue. I'll write Y, press enter. Okay, so the installation of idle 3 has now begun. Okay, so you see that it has been installed now. Now we're going to launch it. So let's just search uh, idle 3 again. idle 3 yes so now we have two options now which one do we launch is our dilemma okay so actually it's the second one let's just select it and uh, yes so we do have this python shell environment installed on our linux system congratulations but let's just type in the mathematical operations again so 34 plus 2 press enter 36 and uh, Let's just assign some to the variables. I have num1 is equal to 34 and I'm going to print its value, which is num1, press enter. So yes, I get it. Okay, but now if we want to create a Python file, we want to create and save a script for that file, new file. And now here I'm going to write my script. I say num1 num is equal to 90 and num2 is equals to let's say 180 press enter and i'm going to print num1 plus num2 bracket close and now i need to save it in order to run it so i go to file save now i need to select the path so let's say i want to save it in my current working directory i'm just going to name the file my module and uh, before I save it, the extension for this is .py because this is the Python file extension. So the extension for Python file is .py. That's why I've just written it over here. And I'm just going to save it. Let's just run it. So for that, we need to go on to the run option. Run and then run the module. Okay, so the shortcut for this is F5. So that's the result that I get. But uh, let's just open the file again and uh, change num1 to let's say 190 instead of 90. Now let's just save it and run it again. So now you see that the result has changed. So thank you for watching this video. I hope that it helped you in order to install and set up a Python environment on your Linux system. Hi, in this lecture we're going to see how to install Python on Mac. For that, firstly, we need to check whether Python has been already installed on our system or not. So for that, I need to launch the administrator panel and I'm going to type Python 3 and no, it's not installed. So it's going to recommend me an option whether I want to install it or not. So just click on cancel for now. We're going to see another way how to do it. Just go to your browser. So this is the official Python website and click download Python. And now just click allow. So this is going to download the setup for Python into your system and it's going to be downloaded into the downloads folder. So just check it in your downloads folder whether the installation setup is there or not. So I'm going to go to the open downloads option. And uh, yes, so it is installed. The setup is installed for now. Just double click this installer and it's going to launch the installer. So we have the installer, click on continue and some more continues, continue, then again continue and uh, 
yes so you see this dialog box just click agree and then we need to click on install so it's going to ask us the password and uh, you need to type in your admin password over here and after typing your admin password you need to click on install software so it will begin your installation procedure so here you can see that the installing has begun and it will take a few minutes depending upon the speed of your internet for me it's saying it takes about two minutes okay so you can see over here that all of the necessary python files are downloaded and they are ready for us to go through just minimize that and just go to close that okay so it's still installing all the necessary files and it has been installed successfully so congratulations click on close it will ask you whether you want to move the installation setup to trash so since I don't need it I'm going to click on move to trash now we're going to launch the terminal and after launching the terminal I'm going to first I'm going to zoom it in now I'm going to type in the command pwd that is it will give us the current working directory and I'm going to change the directory then again I'm going to change it since I want to go to the root directory and now in the root directory I'm going to list all of the di directories by using the command ls now here I'm going to go to applications and after that I'm in applications now I'm going to type in python 3 and then I'm going to see the version for this so double dash version this is giving me the version 3.83 that I just installed and downloaded and uh, after typing the command python 3 it gives me that it is installed and I've uh, performed some functions over here which is giving me the result which is 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 and 3 is greater than 5 is false thank you for watching and this is how you install and set up python on mac when a machine wants to learn a certain algorithm it needs data to learn now there are many different techniques for gathering this data in this module we will be going through the step-by-step -step procedures for collecting data processing them knowing what formats they are contained in and how you can bring them to your machine in order for it to learn and become familiar with. The question which comes first in mind is, what actually is data acquisition? The simple answer to this is that data acquisition is the process of collecting a data set that is relevant to the scope of learning algorithm that you are looking for. But in further detail, there are mainly two basic requirements for the applications of machine learning data collection and model. Data acquisition is the core part for the machine learning and artificial intelligence. Without a data set, one cannot simply apply these techniques. The basic three approaches to data set collection are number one, data discovery. Data discovery is the collection and analysis of data from various sources to gain insights from hidden patterns and trends. Through the data discovery process, data is gathered, it's combined, analyzed in a sequence of steps. The goal is to make messy and scattered data clean, understandable and user friendly. Next comes data augmentation. Data augmentation is a strategy that enables practitioners to significantly increase the diversity of data available for training models. This is done without actually collecting new data. Data augmentation techniques such as cropping, padding, and horizontal flipping are commonly used to train a machine learning model. Then comes data generation. This refers to the theory of methods used by researchers to create data from a sampled data source in a qualitative study. Data sources include human participants, documents, organization, electronic media, and events. When collecting the data for machine learning, there are some challenges to it as well. Few of the challenges are stated over here. Let's just see them one by one. Number one is data volume. Continuous learning is possible with the use of existing data, which means that a lot of data is required for training your machine. 
Then comes data presentation. Limited data and faulty presentations can interrupt the predictive analysis for which machine learning data is built. Then we have variety of data. Machine learning needs data that is comprehensive to perform automated tasks. Data from multiple areas are useful. And then data accuracy. Data itself is a challenge, especially if inconsistent, biased, or insufficient. Procuring data. Obtaining large data sets requires a lot of effort for companies. Other than that, deduplication, removing inconsistencies are some of the major and time-consuming activities. And then lastly, we have data permissions. Personal data, if collected without permission, can create legal issues. Collecting your data must have a source depending upon what type of model is to be trained. Varying application-wide. The dataset which you may need for application can be sourced from either a freely available data source over the internet or you can get the source data internally from your organization's internal data source. Depending upon the type of application you need to train your machine for, the data might be freely available or if the data is confidential, it might only be with some specific organizations. We will be going through some of the data sources that are public data sources, Excel or Google Sheets, web scraping, and lastly, internal data sources. Let's put some light on public data sources first. There are more than a million free data sources available over the internet. These data sets are contributed by companies and government bodies made publicly available for data science enthusiasts. This is where we will be mainly focusing. Some of the common data sources available for free are Google Dataset powered by Google Platform, Kaggle.gov Dataset, 538, UCI ML Repository. The first question that we're going to address is what are internal data sources? The most common source of data is the organizational internal database. So this data is already collected, it's refined, it's clean, and it's pre-processed. Other internal data sources include online transaction processing, which is also referred to as OLTP data, which contains the transactional information which could possibly be modified, it could be updated and or deleted. Next is the data warehousing data, which is the analytical data or data using which you can make reports. Then comes the log files. These are generally the events that might be recorded at certain instance, which can be IP addresses or location of different people trying to access what type of content. Sensors and networks, currently referring to the in-demand topic, which is Internet of Things. These use sensors over the network and they generate a very large amount of data in very little time. So coming up next, we will discuss data preparation process, of which data collection is the first stage. The problem statement should be clear in order to know what type of data needs to be collected, what should be the data features, and where can we collect the data for this task. After the data collection, we move on to data pre-processing stage. In this stage, the data is formatted to a standard protocol, and in the final stage, the data is transformed into a machine understandable format, which are only numerics. When talking about a data set for machine learning, our data format is of great importance. Understanding the basic data formats you get the data in and manipulating them can be helpful for getting fruitful results in the machine learning process. There are numerous formats of datasets. You might get a humongous data, which can be in one of the formats, maybe say CSV, text, JSON, XLS, or even any other format. Each format has different layout and a different look and feel. So among these numerous formats, the popular data formats are, number one, CSV, which stands for comma separated values, number two, Excel or Google Sheet, and number three, JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Let's see these common data formats in detail. First, we have comma-separated value. This format contains data that are separated by commas. Each value before the comma belongs to a specified feature. 
Let's take a look at the CSV file that we have over here. Now considering the first three labels we see passenger ID, comma survived, comma P class and so on so forth. Now moving on to the next row, the first value 1 belongs to the first label which is passenger ID. Similarly, the second value 0 belongs to the second label which is survived. And in the same way, the third value 3 belongs to the third label which is P class. This could be easier to understand if the data was less in quantity. But the data isn't for us. It is for the machine to understand. And the machine understands it with the help of the comma, same as we discussed. A comma separated value is a delimited text file that uses a comma to separate values. Each line of the file is a data record. The use of comma as a field separator is the source of the name for this file format. Next, we have an Excel file format, the extension for which is .xls or xlsx. This is one of the common formats which we also use in our daily lives. This format is easier to understand because of its format styled in table form. So we see here the same data that was previously used to understand the CSV format. Now it is here in the XLS format. And here it is very easy to understand the labels in the respective data. In an Excel formatted data, the columns represents the features of the data set, whereas the rows represents the number of the recorded features against each feature. As most of the machine learning tools use the CSV format and the data which humans usually record is the tabulated format, that is the Excel format, Hence, it is important to know how to convert the data from Excel to the CSV format and vice versa. JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, is very simple and lightweight data interchange format. It is easy for humans to understand and machines to interpret. JSON is supported by hundreds of applications as a data format. Some of these applications include networking automation, programming, configuration files, and data science. Data in the JSON format can easily be converted to CSV, XML, spreadsheets or CSV format. This is an example of how actually a JSON file looks like. Till now, we have looked at what is data acquisition, their formats, and what are their sources. Now we're going to see how we can use the public sources in order to obtain these data sets. Being a data scientist, data collection is a very important process. Data that is readily available, easy to access, which can be available publicly over the internet is preferred over other sources. Before moving on to the public sources that we will be discussing, let's have an overview of what is a dataset. Dataset is a collection of related data that contains useful information for modeling a machine. A dataset may have one or more database tables having data of different data entities. A column in a dataset represents variable, attribute, or you can say a feature. Any dataset can have multiple features, but it depends upon the data scientist which to use and which not. A row in a dataset represents a record or an observation. The total count of the row accounts for the total number of data points in our dataset. Point to be taken here is that in order to apply a machine learning model for prediction, you must have at least more than 1000 data points in your dataset. You can download data from various public data sources for practicing data analysis and data science. An expert level data analyst may create a data set by themselves. But if you are new to the field and learning data analysis and data science, then you can grab data sets from free and public data sources that we are about to discuss. Among those, the most common are Kegel.gov dataset and UCI machine learning. Let's just explore them one by one. K 
Kegel is one of the famous and most commonly used sources for acquiring machine learning dataset. It has the largest data science community. Kegel offers a web integrated platform for coding your notebook and getting the results. On the online forum, you can add the collaborators to your projects as well. Kegel also hosts machine learning competitions in which the competitors design a machine learning model which is fast as well as accurate enough to predict the outputs. Next, .gov datasets are countrywide repositories of data made available by their respective governments, with the United States, China and many more countries becoming artificial intelligence superpowers, data is being democratized. The rules and regulations related to these datasets are usually stringent as they are actual data collected from various sectors of a nation. Thus, cautious use is recommended. Some of the countries that are openly sharing their datasets include Australian Government Dataset, European Open Data Portal, New Zealand's Government Dataset, and Singapore's Government Dataset. The UCI Machine Learning Repository is a collection of databases, domain theories, and data generators. These are used by machine learning community for the empirical analysis of machine learning algorithms. It is used by students, educators and researchers all over the world as a primary source of machine learning data sets. As an indication of the impact of the archive, it has been cited over a thousand times. Once we have acquired the data, next we want to do is to look into the data. Let's see what we have. Mike, Julie, Everill and John are four college students. We want to see whether they play basketball or not. Can you answer this? Wait, no. But why? The answer to this question is because we don't have enough information about their background. What does it mean? It means that the set of features to predict the result is unavailable to us without which we won't be able to predict the results. Now here we are provided with a set of parameters for some students. It contains their roll numbers, exam grades and their heights and weights. So can you use the given data set to predict the answer we are looking for? Yes, but the question is how? In order to predict that a given student will either play basketball or not, we need to design a model that needs to be trained on a training data set. Here is the training data set. The given features are the input for the training model and the predicted result is the output represented by Y. Now there are feature set accounting for the results. Here we need to check which values are responsible which features play an important role and what doesn't affect the predicted results. All this needs to be evaluated. For this, we use the exploratory data analysis technique. Let's see what it is. Just pause for a moment and try to memorize this data set as we are going to discuss it for applying the EDA techniques. EDA, also known as Exploratory Data Analysis, is a scheme to explore your dataset you have acquired in the first step. During this process, the data scientist gains an insight to the data and its underlying structure. By doing this, you get aware of the dataset, understand what story the data tells, and get an idea of the next step for the processing of data and gain a hypothesis to answer the questions for your research. With the help of the statistical tools in Python, we can perform the EDA on our data to explore it and analyze it. In a nutshell, EDA summarizes the main characteristics of the dataset. Looking forward towards the steps involved in the process for EDA, the main steps involved are stated here and we are going to look into each of these individually. Let's start with features, data and variable types. 
I hope you remember the basketball example in the data set that we discussed earlier. Let's start the exploratory data analysis of that data set. If we look at the variable types we have, or to be more specific regarding the data features we have, we see that it has input variables or the predictor variables and the output variable, which is our target variable. The features, that is gender, exams grade, height, and weight, are our predictor variables, whereas the target variable is play basketball. Okay, so talking about the data types that we have in our data set, the character type data is the gender feature as it contains the value M or F. The numeric data type we have are the exam grades, the height and the weight of the students and the play basketball output. Moving on the variable category, this is the term used to identify the variable type. In common, there are two basic variable types, the categorical and the continuous. In categorical variables, we talk about those variables which can be categorized. For example, gender feature, it can be categorized as either male or female only. Similarly, the play basketball variable has value 0 or 1 representing that the student will not play or play basketball respectively. Whereas the continuous variables are those which have any value like that, we cannot categorize them. For example, the exam marks, as they can be any value in the continuous range, Likewise, the same goes for the case of height and the weight values. The univariate analysis. The method for univariate analysis depends upon the variable type. When talking about the continuous type, these are the values which are continuous within a range, which means that we can analyze the values for such a single feature using the statistical tool applicable for the continuous data sets. For example, using the mean, median, or mode on the feature values. Similarly, finding the min and max values, applying range or quartile. This information will help us understand the spread of values and their range. Contrary to this, the categorical variables can be analyzed using the discrete statistical tools or those functions that can be applied on a grouped data set. For example, our data set can have gender male or female. Using the frequency table, we can say how many males and how many of them are females. Similarly, we can acquire the percentage for it. Bivariate analysis finds out the relationship between two variables. Here we look for association and disassociation between variables at a predefined significance level. We can perform bivariate analysis for any combination of categorical and continuous variables. This combination can be categorical and categorical, categorical and continuous, and continuous and continuous. Different methods are used to tackle these combinations during analysis process. Let's say we have three variables, A, B, and C, and we want to perform bivariate analysis onto it. The simplest approach is the correlation matrix. As we can see a matrix for the correlation, here the diagonals contain ones, because A itself fully dependent on A, and so is B and C. But we can also see some positive and negative numbers. The positive number means that as one variable increases, the other also increases, whereas the negative number indicates that as the one variable increases, the other decreases. Now, the numbers represent how strong the relationship is between variables. Although we are going to be discussing this section in detail, but to have a brief overview of what missing values and outliers are, Let's begin. A missing value is something that your data set does not contain. Either it was not recorded or left optional. It can also be referred to as an incomplete data set. Outliers are values which are out of the expected range. These are very critical in model training as it can lead to very dangerous outcomes. 
Calculating the statistics of data including outliers gives much variated results. Feature engineering is the science and art of extracting more information from existing data. For example, let's say you're trying to predict footfall in a shopping mall based on the dates. Now, if you try and use the dates directly, you may not be able to extract the meaningful insights from the data. This is because the footfall is less affected by the day of the month than it is by the day of the week. Now, this information about the day of the week is implicit in your data. You need to bring it out to make your model better. This exercise of bringing out the information from the data is known as feature engineering. The machine learning process involves the following mentioned steps and processes. Let's just discuss each of them separately so that we get to know the importance of EDA. The first step in machine learning process is the problem statement, the purpose of developing a model. Then we look at why there is a need to solve this problem and that too using the machine learning approach. Next comes the problem solving approach, which connects us to the problem data collection step. Reason being that the approach is identified once when the data collection is done. After the problem defining step is done, we go for the data collection process, which we have studied in the previous lectures. The data collection source is very much crucial as the data collected must be authentic and well in line with the context to the problem, which is to be solved. The quality of the data depends upon the authenticity of the data set obtained during the collection process. However, its remediation process involves its refinement by passing it through the filtration process, organizing it and migrating it so that it is fit for the purpose and use. After we have organized the data, then comes into play the whole analysis that we have discussed in this lecture, the exploratory data analysis, EDA. This process is the backbone for the training of the machine learning model. Any negligence at this stage of analysis can lead to serious effects negatively impacting our model. With the knowledge we have gained during our initial lectures, depending upon the data sets and their category or type, we train our model. The model which is answerable to our questions on the problems we have focused in the first stage of the process. Once the model is trained and the model is ready after evaluation to provide us the results, the last step is to communicate them to the user in a presentable format which is easily understandable. Till now we have seen the process of EDA in numerical format, which is a bit boring, but people tend to avoid the mathematical values. These explorations can be done visually as well. In the next lecture, we will see how we can explore our data visually using the Python interface.
Once the data collection process is over, the next phase is data cleaning. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss this phase in detail. After we are done collecting the data set for our application, the next thing we must be concerned about is the quality of the data. Data sets are mostly flawed. And we know that our machine learning model is totally based on our data set. This is why data preparation or cleaning is a very important step in machine learning. Data scientists spend around 80% of their time in this process of data cleaning. The steps for data cleaning starts from the removal of unwanted observations in which irrelevant or duplicate data values are removed. Duplicate observations may result in during the data collection process, whereas irrelevant data refers to such data which does not line up in the contrast to the problem for which the solution is to be devised. The next step is fixing the structural errors which arise during the data recording process, or we can say at the time of measurement, data handling or transferring. This type of error includes typos, incorrect labeling, upper and lower case for the same label name, etc. After this comes in managing the unwanted outliers, because the outliers can cause trouble with certain model types for example, the linear models are less robust to outliers than the decision tree models. So these must be focused not to be used in training data sets as we can remove them not likely being part of the real data. After this, the final stage is the missing data handling. The missing data or observation cannot be simply ignored. It must be carefully handled as it can be leading towards useful or important information. After the data which has been collected is once cleaned, it can then be used to apply statistical models to see for the rest of the left unwanted values and then move towards the complete model which will predict the desired outputs and related to the real world. We will look at the data cleaning aspects on the Titanic data set. For this, we will start with the exploratory data analysis which will give us an insight to the missing data, either some values need to be adjusted, what are the undesired data that we can wipe off and much more. Missing values can cause you to miss your target. Considering this element, a missing value depicts a missing information. These incomplete values can cause our model to misbehave and predict a sort of randomized results. The point is we want our model to predict the actual facts and figures. But when there are missing values, the model will then be predicting results based on assumptions. Once such missing data is catered, you are good to go and achieve your model goals. Real world data often has missing values. Data can have missing values for a number of reasons such as observations that were not recorded and data corruption. Handling missing data is important as many machine learning algorithms do not support data with missing values. Here is a data set for the Titanic data set containing the missing values, the age column and the cabin numbers. If we say we need to calculate the average age of all passengers who boarded the Titanic, we can calculate the value. But this value won't be accurate and that's because of the missing values. There are multiple ways in which we can deal with missing values. The very first is deleting rows. This method is commonly used to handle the null values. Here we either delete a particular row if it has a null value for a particular feature and a particular column, if it has more than 70 to 75% of missing values. This method is advised only when there are enough samples in the dataset. One has to make sure that after we have deleted the data, there is no addition of bias and removing the data will lead to loss of information which will not give the expected results while predicting the output. So the second way is replacing with mean, median or mode. This strategy can be applied on a feature which has numeric data like the age of a person or the ticket fare. We can calculate the mean, median or mode of that feature and replace it with the missing value. But what about the categorical data? So for that, we have another method, which is assigning a unique category. A categorical feature will have a definite number of possibilities. 
such as gender for example. So since they have a definite number of classes, we can assign another class for the missing values. Here the features such as cabin and embarked have missing values which can be replaced with the new category say you for unknown. This strategy will add more information into the data set which will result in the change of variance. Another method is predicting the missing values. Now using the features which do not have missing values, we can predict the nulls with the help of a machine learning algorithm. This method may result in better accuracy unless a missing value is expected to have a very high variance. And lastly, we can use some algorithms that support missing values. Such an algorithm is KNN, which works on the principle of distance measure. This algorithm can be used when there are null present in the data set. While the algorithm is applied, KNN considers the missing values by taking the majority of the k-nearest values. In this particular data set, taking into account the person's age, sex, class, etc., we will assume that people having same data for the above mentioned features will have the same kind of fear. In this lecture, we are going to deal with another part of data cleaning which is detection and cleaning of the outliers. But before we do that, what is an outlier? Outlier is the terminology mostly used by the scientists and data analysts which refers to the data points that are not part of the actual data set. It is of very much importance because if not taken proper care, it can result in skewed measurements. In other words, it's a data point that lies outside the overall distribution of the data set. You can see over here in our example that there is a set of 9 values which is ranging from 18 to 30, but a very large value which is 4300 appears in it. This value is not part of our data set, but from some source of uncertainty is contained in our set. This value can have a very bad impact over the statistical analysis of our data. Let's see where do these values come from, what effects do they have and how can we eliminate them. There are many reasons for outliers in our data set. Some of the common ones are data entry errors or it can be caused due to the measurement error Say we have a temperature sensor installed in our room. The device measures the temperature and sends the value to the database which store the values. Due to the sensor error or some randomness exposed to the sensor, it might cause wrong value feeding to our data set. These can be a source for outliers in our data set. As you can see, data set with outliers has significantly different mean and standard deviation. In the first scenario, we will say that the average is 5.45, but with the outlier average soars to 30. This would change the estimate completely. This summarizes that our results can be badly impacted due to the outliers. Until now, we have seen the outlier impact with a smaller data set, but how can we observe for the existence of an outlier on larger data sets? For that, we use some statistical tools for visually analyzing such existence. Few detection techniques involve box plot, histogram, and scatter plot. Let's have a quick view for them all. A box plot is a standardized way of displaying the distribution of data based on a five number summary, which is minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum. It can tell you about your outlier and what their values are. It can also tell you if your data is symmetrical, how tightly your data is grouped, and if and how your data is skewed. Now as for histogram, it plots the values on a frequency scale which actually shows the occurrence of a specific value. Outliers are often easy to spot in histograms. For example, the point on the far left in the above figure is an outlier. Outliers can also occur when comparing relationships between two sets of data. Outliers of this type can be easily identified on a scatter diagram. When dealing with outliers, most of the ways to deal with them are similar to the methods used for missing values like deleting observations, transforming them, binning them, treating them as a separate group, imputing values and other statistical methods.
having some standards for the data makes life easier. Data standardization is the process of rescaling one or more attributes so that they have a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. Data standardization is a data processing workflow that converts the structure of the disparate data sets into a common data format. As part of the data preparation field, data standardization deals with the transformation of data sets after the data is pulled from the source systems and before it's loaded into the target systems. It is about making sure that the data is internally consistent. That is, each data type has the same content and format. Standardized values are useful for tracking data that isn't easy to compare otherwise. For example, suppose you and your friend went to different universities. One day you both got your midterm grades for your chemistry classes. Your professor sticks to the normal grading scale out of 100. So you got a grade of 84, the test has a mean of 77 and a standard deviation of 6. Your friend's professor though uses his own grading scale, so she got a grade of 452. Her test has a scale of 750 and mean of 400 and standard deviation of 100. Both of you scored above average, but who did better? While the main data points might not be immediately comparable, there is a way to standardize and compare the data points, converting them to percentages shows that you come out ahead with an 84% compared to your friends 60%. Collect data in common formats. This is when you make sure that your survey is set up to record the same data point in the same format every time. For example, people's dates of birth shouldn't be collected as June 1986. 21 January 1974 and 1956 in the same survey. Collect data based on preset standards. If there are pre-existing international or local standards for how the measures and count a particular data point, stick to them. For example, the SDG indicators are a great international standard that more organizations are adopting today. Transform data to a common format. During data cleaning, data standardization involves changing different data formats to just one format. Convert data to z-scores. Rather than showing a data point on its own scale, z-score shows how many standard deviations a data point is from the mean. This conversion happens during data cleaning or analysis. Hi guys, in this lecture video, we'll be talking about data normalization, which is an important technique to understand in data preprocessing. Normalization is the process of scaling individual samples to have a unit norm. This process can be useful if you plan to use a quadratic form such as the dot product or any other kernel to quantify the similarity of any pair of samples. Normalization is a technique often applied as part of data preparation for machine learning. The goal of normalization is to change the values of numeric columns in the data set to a common scale, but without distorting differences in the ranges of values. For machine learning, every data set does not require normalization. It is required only when the feature have different ranges. When we take a look at the used car data set, we notice in the data that the feature length ranges from 150 to 250, while feature width and height ranges from 50 to 100. We may want to normalize these variables so that the range of the values is consistent. This normalization can make some statistical analysis easier. By making the ranges consistent between variables, normalization enables a fair comparison between different features, making sure they have the same impact. It is also important for computational reasons. Here is another example that will help you understand why normalization is important. So consider a dataset containing two features, one being the age and other being the income. 
where age ranges from 0 to 100 while the income ranges from 0 to 20,000 and higher. So the income is about 1000 times larger than the age and it ranges from 20,000 to 500,000. So you see that both of the features have very different ranges. And when we do further analysis, for instance, the linear regression, the attribute income will have an immense effect on the result more due to its larger value. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it is more important as a predictor. So that's why we have data biases in the linear regression model to weigh the income more heavily than the age. To avoid this, we can normalize these two variables into values that range from 0 to 1. Compare the two tables at the right. After normalization, both variables now have a similar influence on the model we will build on later. There are several ways to normalize data, but we will just outline three techniques over here. The first, the first method is a very simple technique. It's called simple feature scaling. Just divides each value by the maximum value for that feature. This makes the new value range between 0 and 1. The second method called the min-max takes each value x old, subtracted from the minimum value of that feature, then divides by the range of that feature, again the resulting new values range between 0 and 1. The third method is called z-score or standard score. In this formula, for each value, you subtract the mu, which is the average of the feature, and then divide by the standard deviation, which is sigma. The resulting values hover around 0 and typically range between negative 3 and positive 3, but can be higher or lower. Following our earlier example, we can apply the normalization method on the length feature. First, use the simple feature scaling method where we divide it by the maximum value in the feature using the pandas method max. This can be done in just one line of code. Here's the min max method on the length feature. We subtract each value by the minimum of that column and then divide it by the range of that column, the maximum minus the min. And finally, we apply the z-score method on the length feature to normalize the values. Here we apply the mean and standard deviation method on the length feature mean method will return the average value of the feature in the data set and the standard deviation method will return the standard deviation of the features in the data set. Hi guys and welcome to the first lab session of our course. This lab is for section 6 in which we're going to see how to import data, perform some exploratory data analysis and data cleaning. Formally what steps we're going to discuss are collecting the data, importing the CSV file formats, how to perform EDA on this data, visually analyze the data, and lastly, how can we clean this data. So let's get to it. In the first step, which is collecting the data, we're going to download the data set of Titanic, and you can do that by clicking this link, which is provided in the document, and you can go to this link and download all of the files, a Titanic zip file will be downloaded in your downloads folder. Just unzip that file and you'll see three CSV files. For your ease, I've pasted the sample image so you'll get a train CSV, one for test and one gender submission. After you're done with downloading your dataset, the next step is importing the dataset to Jupyter. This is a very important step as for our data to mean something and for us to perform machine learning on, on it, we need to bring it into Jupyter Notebook. So before we do that, let's just see how can we import certain libraries into our Jupyter Notebook. We're going to import Pandas library that we already discussed in the conceptual phase of our course. So this library is written for Python language and it's mainly for data manipulation and analysis. In particular, it offers data structures and operations for manipulating numerical tables in time series. 
So let's just see how we can import this library or as a matter of fact any library. So the keyword that we use is import in order to import any library. After that we write the name of the library that we want to import. And then we give an alias to this library and using this alias we can use the functions of this library. For executing this cell we press shift and enter simultaneously. And you can see that this code of line or the cell has been executed perfectly. Another way to import the library is using the PyLab magic function. So this PyLab is a magic function that can be called in IPython and by calling this the interpreter will import the matplotlib and numpy modules. So for that we need a percentage sign and then the PyLab keyword. And the inline function basically plots all of your figures in line, in a single row. So we'll see that practically moving on. Similar to the previous cell, for executing this we need to press shift and enter simultaneously and you see that this has been performed and there is no error, it's been executed. So whenever we import the file for data analysis, we need to know that where the notebook in form of the read or the import files where they actually persist. So to ensure that our file is placed at the current location, we have a very important library which is OS and it stands for operating system. So it's an operating system library. So to import it, we'll use the import keyword along with the OS library name. So shift and enter in order to execute it. Moving on to the next cell, we are going to call its function get cwd, which is get the current working directory. And when I execute it, you see that my current working directory is users t460s, so it's in that folder. So it's telling me that where my current working directory, actually what my current working directory is. After building up the entire foundation, now we are here in order to read or import the CSV file. So we are going to use the alias of the pandas library which is pd dot read csv. This is actually the function of this library and I am going to give this path or the name of my file where I want this to read the data. And this, the output for this is going to be loaded into this variable name which is df. Now I need to press shift enter in order for this to execute so the file has not actually been found. So this is a very common error that you might get if your file is not in the current working directory. So as it says that my current working directory is this. So I actually need to paste my file over here. So I am going to go into my downloads. I'm going to take these files and I'm going to go to C, users and this folder and I'm going to paste this here. Now let's just try this again. Yes, so it's done. So all of the data has been imported to df variable. Now let's see what's in this data. Okay, so by using the variable name df and I'm not using print over here, simply df and using shift and enter in order to execute it. So you see the output over here, it's that I have all of this data. We're going to see this data in detail in a bit. So you see that I have 891 rows and I have 12 columns. So let's move on to the part of exploratory data analysis. So the very first thing is I'd want to see the shape of my data. For that I have the command dot shape. So let me just press shift and enter and you see that I have 891 rows and I have 12 columns. Same as above, let's just tally it. So you see these many rows and these many columns. And if you want to see the end of the data, that is I want to see only the data that is at the end of uh, the entire variable, the tail of the data. For that I have the function dot tail, shift enter and Okay, so this is the tail of my data. That means the data which is at the end. So you can see the indices number over here. So it's showing me the row number 886, 887, 888 moving on. So this is all of the data that is at the end of my variable. So these are the end rows. Now I want a summary of my data. 
So to perform or to know your data better in order to perform EDA, you need to know the details of your data. So for that, we use dot describe. Shift enter. So here it tells me the count of the passenger ID survive, P class, age. And you can see that age is slightly less than all of the others. So it's probably because there might be some missing values that we discussed earlier. So that's why it's giving me a lesser number over here. So the mean for all of these is stated over here. Same as I have standard deviation, I have the minimum value and then 25% quartile, 50%, 75% and lastly the maximum value amongst these. So as you can see that somebody paired 5, 12, I don't know actually the currency but this is the amount or the highest fare that has been paid and the lowest fare you can see that it's zero. So somebody actually paid zero fare in order to get on Titanic. So we're going to explore that. So similar to the previous case, we saw how we can see the tail of the data. Now we're going to see how we can see the head of the data. That is the starting rows of the data. So for that, we have the function dot head. And let me just enter, press shift enter. And OK, so this is the head of the data. So now you see that the indices from 0 to 4 are showing contrary to the tail function. So let's just discuss all of the columns that we have. So we have 12 columns in our data set. Number one is the passenger ID. So this is the passenger number for which of them in our data set starting from 1 to 891. Survived in the survived column, this is basically it's going to be our target column. And uh, over here, zero means that the person did not survive. That means that the person died. And one means that they survived and they're alive. The P class is actually the passenger ticket class where 1 is first class, 2 is second class and 3 stands for third class and then the sex represents the gender of the passenger. Age contains the age number of the passenger. Sib SP. So this actually this column is for if that person we are exploring, that passenger, he or she if they have any spouse or they have any sibling. So the number shows the total count for that. And P arch or parch, so this value represents if they had any parents or children of the passenger if present. So it shows the total count for that. Next, the ticket is the ticket number of the passenger. The fare is the amount of fare they paid in order to board. And cabin is the cabin number of passenger. And lastly, embarked contains from which port they actually embarked. So C stands for this, Q for Queen Show and S for Southampton. So these are the ports from where they embarked. So let's just see the type of the data for each column. That is the data type of the column. For that, we have a function that is D types. So I'm printing df dot D types and I'm going to shift enter. And you see that it's telling me that the passenger ID is integer. So it survived in P class. Name and sex, they're actually object. So it's a very interesting fact over here that all of the strings you'll see that they appear as objects rather than the string. So age is float and same you can see that cabin and embark since they contain uh, strings and ticket as well so these are objects. Now let's see what if I don't print and simply just write df dot dead types. Curious to do so. Pressing enter and we get the same result so there's no need to print it Okay, so now for the number of survived passengers, I want to find out how many of the passengers they actually survived and how many did not survive. So for that, I have df, which is my variable name, dot survived, which is my column name, and value counts is actually the function name. So if I execute it, so you can see that number of people who didn't survive are 459, and the ones who survived are 3. 42. Now let's just count gender wise. So I want to see how many were male and how many were female. So instead of survived, I'm going to use sex as the column name. Shift enter and OK. So the males that survived, uh, actually the males that were on board, this is a respective of if they were, if they survived or not survived. So the number of males is actually 577 and number of females is 314. Okay, now I want my data to be visually 
explored so i want to visually explore it and i want to make a histogram for males and female count so i don't want the output in this form that i earlier got in terms of rows and columns now i want it to be plotted so for that i'll use the plot function and in the kind parameter i'm going to give it bar so that is i want the plot to have bars so it's basically a bar plot so here you can see that males are actually more than females and then again this is irrespective of whether they survived or not survived and then i want to plot a histogram for fair so i am writing df dot fair which is my column name and instead of writing dot plot kind bar i'm simply writing hist which is a function and it plots the histogram so i'm going to shift enter and yes so this is my fear okay so here we can see that the people who pay the fare from 0 to 50 are slightly more than 700 and the people who paid the fare from 50 to 100 are a little more than 100 and so on and so forth so there are very few people who paid more than 500 or between 400 to 500 in order to board Titanic so moving on to the data cleaning phase in data cleaning phase we're going to see that how we can extract the name titles that is Mr. Mrs. etc from the name feature and we're going to be filling in the missing information Moreover, we're going to separate and categorize the uncategorized data in the data set and we're going to create the CSV file for the cleaned data set. So the pre-processing phase of data analysis or for data cleaning. So before we start the data cleaning part um, of our data, we will first look at any insight of the complete data in light with the cleaning we need to do. So before we begin, you know the drill that we need to import certain libraries. So I'm going to import matplotlib pyplot and I'm going to give it an alias, which is plt. Then I'm going to use the inline function for that. So I want all of my plots to appear inline. And I'm also going to import a library seaborn. We saw that these both libraries are used for visualization. So this is its alias. So let's just shift and enter in order to execute this. So it is executed. So now we're going to explore the categorical features visually. For that, we're defining a function bar chart. Firstly, we need to make a copy of this existing variable in df copy. And in the bar chart function, I have the survived and dead variable. And in that, we are only keeping the information for survived where the value is 1, their value count. And in the dead, we are give, getting all of the information for the people who did not survive, so where the survived value is equal to 0. And we have another df new, another variable, and it's basically data frame type, and it contains the survived and dead features. And then again, we have the indices for survived and dead, and lastly, we are going to plot this information. So here we are going to give it a feature parameter and it's going to plot the bar chart or the bar plot for that. So let's begin with the gender based survival. So the feature for that is sex, that's the column name and let me execute it. And you can see that we have two bars over here. So this is a stacked bar plot. When we talked about the survived bar, you can see that more of female survived rather than male. Now when we talk about the other bar, you can see that more of the females survived. So the females actually, there were less number of females who died rather than the males. Now let's do the same for P class. So over here you can see in the histogram above, it shows that the first class they survived more rather than the third class. So the color for first class is blue, so they survived more rather than the third class, which is green, and uh, the second class, which is orangish. And then when we talk about the people who died, so you can see that third class were more dead, and it's more likely than the first and the second class. So let's perform this analysis on the sibling and spouse. So what does this histogram shows us? It shows that the passenger with no sibling or spouse has more likely died 
than others. Okay, so let's perform this analysis again on parent and child survival and you can see that the people are more likely to die who have a zero count of parent or child. Now we're going to see the feature extraction and we're going to extract the title which is Mr. Miss or Mrs. from the name feature. So here is the code for that. So firstly, we, are, we have another variable which is df new through which we're going to loop through and it contains uh, df data frame and uh, now in the data set title we are extracting all of the titles from the name feature and extract is the function that we are using and we are extracting it basis on any space or any dot or so these are the values on the basis of which we are extracting it. So let me execute this and after that let's just print out the head so here you can see we have an additional feature which is title so it contains mr mrs miss or whatever the title is now let's just see the title count so here you can see the title count that we have it's that mr is 517 mrs 182 and so on and so forth so now let's just clean our data set. The convention that we're going to use is that we're going to give Mr. the value 0, Miss 1, Mrs. 2 and others 3. So all of the rest, the rest of the titles which don't contain a very high value, we're going to give them 3. So here is our title mapping. We're using a dictionary over here. So for a Mr. keyword, we're going, we're giving it the value zero for Miss one, Mrs. two, and rest of all of these, we're giving them the value three. After that, now we are changing the value of title with this mapping value that we have over here. So we're using the map function to map all of these value to that respective title. Now let's just print the head. So you see that the title is either 0, 2, 1 or 3. Now let's use this title feature in our bar chart function that we defined. And here you can see that the people who died are more likely to be Mr. As per the mapping you can see that the Mr. value is 0 and Mrs. is 1. So more of the people who died were male and they were misters. And you can see that more of the females, they survived. So now let's just do the same for gender. Here we're going to assign male the value 1 and female the value 0. So I'm just going to replace male with 1 and female with 0. Printing it. You can see that the values for male and female are changed. The second step that we're going to see over here is filling the missing values or missing information in the data set. It is very important. So before we fill in the missing information, we must first know what information is missing from our data set. So let's just see how we can do that. So then again, I'm going to use the shape attribute. It's giving me that now it's giving me 13 columns since we added one more. And let's instead of describe use info function. So this info function it gives you the null count and the data type. So you can see over here in age we do have some missing values. So since the total amount of rows is 891 but we have 714 over here that means that we have some missing values. Similar is the case with cabin and uh, embarked as well. So now let's just check the sum for the null value. So we use a function is null. It is a boolean. It returns a boolean value that is 0 or 1 whether it is null or not null. And then we're going to calculate the sum for that. Sorry. Let me just shift enter. And now you can see that we have 177 age rows that are null and we have 687 cabin and 2 embarked. So this is the sum for all of the null values. So we discussed some of the approaches for filling in the missing values. Over here we will fill in the missing value with respect to the title feature that we made. There are a number of approaches for filling in the missing values that we discussed earlier. 
we will fill in the missing values with respect to the title we made like to fill in the ages of male we will take the mean of the male titles and similarly we will do for the females over here we have another variable which is missing ages and it will contain only those rows which have the age feature as null let me just execute this and then execute the missing ages so this is my data frame that contains all of the rows where age is null this nan stands for null now i'm going to take the mean ages and i'm going to group that by sex and p class after that let's see what the mean ages are so here you can see that for female which is 0 and p class 1 2 3 so these are the mean ages and similarly for the male and the p class we have these mean ages so now we have another function which fills in the null values and over here this function checks if the age is null and it replaces it with the mean value so it checks the group for that and according to that group it just replaces that value otherwise it just returns the row of the age as it is we have executed this now we are going to apply this to the age column and now let's just see how many nulls do we have with respect to age so here you can see now we have zero nulls in the age column moving on we're going to see how we can categorize the uncategorized data in the data set so the age of different people has various values it has some continuous values and we need to categorize them in terms of their classes this process or method is known as binning or categorizing of data so in binning we firstly make a feature vector map so if the person has an age which is similar to the age of a child then we're going to give it zero category if, a, if he or she is young then they're going to have the young category which is one adult two mid age three and senior four so this is the code for that according to certain condition that is if the age is less than equals to 16 so that person is zero that is he or she is a child similar if the age is greater than 16 but, but less than equals to 26 then we have the category one and so on and so forth so according to these conditions we will categorize or we'll bin our age feature now let's just execute this and see what do we get so here you can see that in the age feature now we're getting all of the categories instead of the continuous values so let's just enter this feature into the bar chart and here now you can see that the people who died they belong to category 2 and category 2 is actually adults so more of the adults they didn't survive now lastly let's just export the cleaned csv file that we have firstly i'm just going to print the head and then i'm going to convert my data frame to csv by using the to csv function over here and i'm going to give it the name titanic data set cleaned.csv let's just execute this and after that i do have uh, another variable which is df underscore clean and i'm going to read my this my clean csv into it and yes so it has been successfully executed and let's just print the head of this clean csv so here you can see that it has been printed thank you for watching the lab and i hope that it cleared many of your theoretical concepts as we had a hands-on session today on it before training, we need to select the model best fit to our data and needs. Given easy to use machine learning Python libraries like scikit-learn and Keras, it is straightforward to fit many different machine learning models on a given predictive modeling data set. The challenge of applied machine learning therefore becomes how to choose among a range of different models that you can use for your problem. There are three types of model used in machine learning namely classification model, clustering model, and the regression model that we have already discussed in module 3. Let's now see the model selection with cross-validation. We'll go over why cross-validation is important. 
understand how it works and see how it can be applied in many different ways. Suppose you need to design a machine learning model for a given fruit, whether it's an apple or an orange. This can be an issue for a farmer to pack them separately for production line and dispatch. In the machine learning approach, the input is represented by x and output as y. The output y can be 0 for an apple or 1 for an orange. In order to design our system, we need to collect the data from the real world. Our dataset will contain different photographs of various fruits and their labels. Once we are done with the data collection, we will train our system and then put into test with the real world helping the farmers to distinguish between the apple and the oranges for their purpose. Let's look at the training process in more detail. As it turns out, we know many ways of training machine learning systems, each with different parameters and settings. For example, we can learn a 1 nearest neighbor system, a 3 nearest neighbor system, a 5 nearest neighbor system, a kernel regression system with a sigma 1, a kernel regression system with a sigma of 2, nice base, support vector machine and many others. The problem of choosing which method to use from a pool of possible methods is known as model selection. We want to choose the model that will learn the best at test time in the real world. But all we have is a fixed data set. One way to choose is to train each method on our data and then test on the same data that we have. This is a terrible idea. It indicates that we are giving the answer key to the model itself before even providing the test data set. Instead, we will do the following. We split our data into sections. Each section is called a fold. In this example, we have four folds. Next, we will iterate through the folds as following. The first iteration we train on folds 2 till 4 and then we test our method unfold1. In this case, the algorithm has never seen fold1 before. Next, we measure the error rate of our method on this fold. We then swap places with folds 1 and 2. Now we train unfolds 1, 3 and 4 and we test unfold. We do repeat this process for each fold with holding that fold from training and then computing error on that fold at test time. Some folds are easier to learn than others. Finally, we combine the four error rates into a single average. This average is known as the cross-validation error. For any single method, cross-validation error is an estimate of how the method would perform if the data we collected is an accurate representation of the real world. We repeat the cross-validation procedure for each method we might select during training. Then we can select the model with minimum cross-validation error. In this case, 5 nearest neighbors is our best guess. For this model will be the best fruit identifier for us. Now that we have chosen our model, we can evaluate it on the real data, but what sort of performance do we expect? Do we expect exactly the same performance as our cross-validation estimates? Maybe our estimate was optimistic or maybe it was too conservative. In fact, the 17% error we found during the model selection process is almost certainly optimistic. This is because model selection has biased or estimate of test error. We chose the best cross-validation error out of many possibilities. So even if we had a pool of 1 million random classifiers, we would still expect at least one of them to have low cross-validation error purely by chance. So we need to take another look at our data. We still use cross-validation, but this time we apply cross-validation twice. First, we separate our data into two parts. The first part will be used for model selection and the second will be used for testing to represent the unseen world. The important point is that the world data is never touched by other model selection procedures. To perform model selection, we divide the data into folds just like before. In this case, we have six folds. We then perform cross-validation for each of our methods to determine an error rate. In this case, 3 nearest neighbor is a method with lowest cross-validation error. Now we can evaluate the result of model selection on our tailed out test data. This time we use all folds of training data during training. Now what does this final number estimate? In fact, it is the estimate of our entire learning process. If we look at the data, we train multiple methods 
and then we select the best according to cross-validation. Finally, we tested on held out data not seen by the algorithm. In other words, we achieved an estimate of how our entire learning procedure, which includes model selection as a part of training, will perform on unseen data. Again, if the world happens to be well represented by our data set, this time our estimate of 16% is most likely conservative since we are only using a portion of the data that we have in order to train our model. In conclusion, firstly, cross-validation is a simple and useful method of model selection. But more importantly, cross-validation is also necessary to obtain an estimate of error of our model selection method. The essential part of a machine learning model is its training. In most of the cases where companies or organizations are entrusted in developing a machine learning model, it is possible that the data is a complete set of information, meaning that there is no separated test data and the training data. When we train a model, the training process needs a data set which is only supposed to have the features essential for a predictor. As the original data contains the answers, so does the training data contains the answers. This data helps the model to train itself using the statistical tools and algorithms. Once a model is developed using the training data set, then it is exposed to the test data. The test data is without the answers and this helps us to test the model whether it gives the desired output or not. For a complete data without the test and training data set apart, splitting the data set is of very much importance in machine learning. The accuracy of machine learning models is one of the important aspects. One can train and test the model for machine learning using the same data set but this has a few flaws as the goal is to estimate the likely performance of the model on an out-of-sample data. However, there are several advantages of data splitting. First being, the model is trained and tested on different data. Second, the predicted values are known for the test data set so the model can be evaluated. Thirdly, testing accuracy is a better estimate rather than training accuracy. Data splitting is of two types. The very first type is serial splitting. In this type, you have a data set, for example, say 1000 samples. Now using the 80-20 ratio, you split your data. We take the first 800 sample as the training data set and the next remaining 200 samples as our test data set, removing their results answer. Here the yellow shows the training data set and the green shows the test data set. Another approach is random splitting. In this type, again supposing that we have a complete data set of 1000 samples. Now we take 800 sample randomly from the data set as our training data and the remaining samples as our test data. These samples are chosen randomly. These samples they are chosen randomly as you can see that the yellow blocks and the green blocks in front of random splitting are not on contiguous locations. Hi guys and welcome to lab 2 of our course. This lab is associated with section 7 in which we are going to see how we can select a particular model and how we are going to train that model. So previously we have seen how we can import a data set and we use the titanic prediction of survivors data set and we are going to continue working with that data set in this lab as well. So before we move any further we need to import the necessary libraries. So here are some data analytics libraries and data visualization libraries. So we have pandas, numpy, random and for visualization we are going to use seaborn and matplotlib spyplot. Let's just execute this cell. It's taking a little time for me. Okay, it's done. So we also need to import some machine learning libraries. So we are going to import from sklearn the linear regression, logistic regression, k and neighbors classifier, decision tree classifier, Gaussian knife base and all of these libraries that you see here they are basically for the evaluation purpose. 
in which we are going to discuss the accuracy score, k-fold, cross-val score, cross-value prediction and confusion matrix. Let me execute this cell first. The next essential step that we have is we need to read our data. So we have two CSV files, one is train and the other is test. I'm going to read the test CSV in test DF and train in train DF. And then we're going to combine both of these in one data frame. So let's just execute this. And after that, let's just print the information in order for both of them in order to gain a little more perspective. Okay, so you guys can see over here that in the first data frame, we have around 12 columns. So we have survived, passenger ID, P class, so on and so forth, and these are their data types. But in the second data frame, we don't have the survived column. That is because survived is our target column and we need to actually predict that column. So that is why this column is missing in our test data frame. So we are training it by giving it the survived column but when we are testing it we are testing it how well does it predict it so that's why that column is missing next i'm just going to describe the train data frame okay so we actually saw this in the previous lab so it's giving me the count mean standard deviation quartiles minimum and maximum and uh, let's just print out this data frame and it's giving me the number of rows, number of columns and all of the data. So we have analyzed this data in the previous lecture so I'm not going to go into the detail of that. So some of the features which we feel that are not relevant in machine learning techniques we're going to drop those features. So the two features that we're going to drop are cabin and ticket. Before drop we're going to see the shape of train and test. So this is the shape for train and this is the shape for test and earlier we declared a variable combine and we combined both of these data frames into it. So you can see that on indices number zero, the shape is this which is similar to the train and on the next index it has this shape which is similar as the, which is actually of the test data frame. Okay, so now we're going to drop the ticket and cabin in both of the data frames. So I'm using the drop function for that. And then again, putting both of these in the combine variable. And now let's just see their after shape. So here we have shape of train, test, and you know, the same as in the previous case. So you can see that now we are having 10 columns instead of 12. And over here we have nine columns instead of 11. The number of rows remains the same in both the cases. Let's just print train df and now you can see that those columns have been dropped. Now we are going to create a new feature. This feature is the same as we did in the previous lab title feature. We're going to extract it from the name feature. And then we are going to represent this information in a cross tab. So now you can see that how many females and male have this respective title. So you can see that we have 517 Mr. and 182 Miss and we have 125 Misses. So now we can replace many titles with a more common name or classify them as rare. So the ones that are rare are these. We are going to replace this title. Okay, so that has been replaced and now let's just group them, group the survived with respect to the title and take the mean. So the mean for master who survived is this, for the mean for miss who survived is this, so on and so forth. So we can convert the categorical titles to ordinal as well. That is for Mr. I'm giving it the value 1, miss I'm giving the value 2, misses 3, master 4 and rare 5. So we saw earlier how we can do that. So I'm not going to explain you the code over here. But we're going to perform this action and then I'm going to print the head. So now you can see that our data actually it has been categorized. So in the title you see I have the categories instead of the strings.
So now we can safely drop the name feature since we have extracted the information that we want from it. So here in this code we are dropping the name feature and the passenger ID since it also doesn't contain a lot of information with which we can do anything. And since I'm dropping it from the train, I am dropping it from the test as well in order to keep some harmony amongst the both and then let's just see their shape. So now we have nine columns in both of them. Now let's just convert the strings to the numeric value that is we are going to map gender to some categorical data as well. That is for female I have, zero, I have one and for male I have zero. So this is the same as we discussed previously. So now you see that we have categories over here for the sex. The next step is to treat the missing values and we are going to treat the missing values in the age feature but we are going to do that very smartly. So first of all we are going to visualize the age in terms of P class and in terms of sex and then we are going to bin it accordingly. So we have used the Seaborn visualization for that. I am using a grid over here and you can see that we have around 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, so we have age on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the count for that. And for p class is equals to 1, sex is equals to 0, we have one graph. The other is for p class is equals to 1 and x is equals to, sex is equals to 1 and so on and so forth. So you can see that how does the age variate according to p class and according to sex. So in the graph here you can see that age between 20 to 40 has higher bars and this is for P class 3 that is the people who travel third class and for sex 0 which is male gender and similarly for the female you can compare both of the ages. So let's start by preparing an empty array to contain the guest values of age based on P class and gender combination. So this is how we are going to create an array. So we have created an array successfully and now we are going to iterate over it for sex 0 and 1 and P class 1, 2, 3 to calculate good guest age. So you can see in this code that we are iterating over the sex and we are iterating over the P class and we have another variable which is guest df which contains all of the values for sex and P class and age but where age is not equals to null we are dropping all of those values. Then we calculate uh, the median for this data frame which is named as age guess. Now we have a list which is guess ages and we are rounding off the age. So if the age is say it's 45.31 so we are rounding it off to the nearest 0.5 age. After we are done with it, now we are making another data frame. Now we are making another data frame in which we are replacing those null values of age with the guest values that we have computed over here. And lastly, we are replacing this data set age feature with another data set age feature. So we are replacing the guest values over here. And lastly, we're just going to print the head of train data frame and the info of the train data frame. Let's just see what we get. So here you can see that the null values are now reduced. So now we don't have any null values in the age feature. So this is a smart way of actually guessing the age and then fixing the missing value problem. After eliminating the null values, the next step is to produce the bins. So we have a function cut in pandas which can get us the bins. So we just need to tell it on which feature we want the bins and how many bins do we want. So I'm telling it that I want to apply this cut function on the age feature and I want five bins or five ranges for that. So it has given me that. But along with that, in the next line, I'm saying that I want survived to be displayed alongside with it. I want to group it by the age band and I want to take the mean of the survived. So it's telling me that in which age range, how many people survived in the Titanic data set. 
The next step is to categorize all of the age values. So we have got the ranges for the ages and we've got the mean of the survived and according to this we are just going to categorize it. So we have these ranges over here according to which we are giving it value 0, 1, 2 and 3. And then we are going to print the head. Okay, so now you can see that we have age band but in the age column now we have the categories. So we are going to drop the age band column since we don't need it anymore. So using the drop function we are going to drop it. So now you see that it has been dropped. Another thing that we are going to do is create a new feature based on the existing feature. This is known as feature engineering. So we are going to create a family size based on the sibling spouse and the parent and child. We are going to iterate through the combined variable and we are going to introduce another feature which is family size. So it's just adding the sibling and spouse for each of the passenger along with their parents and child and one is for that passenger him or herself. Next we are going to display this information. We have family size and survived. It is grouped by the family size and we are taking the mean of survived. So let's just see that information. So now you can see the family size and you can see what were their chances of surviving. We are also going to create another feature which is called is alone and we're going to see that if the person was alone what were his or her chances of survival. So I'm not going to explain this code since we have gone through it many of times. So if the person is alone, so if the person was alone, his survival chances were 0.5 and if he was accompanied by his family, his survival chances were 0.3. So now we're going to drop the parent, child, sibling, spouse and family size feature because uh, we think that is alone is giving us a lot of information. And the rest of the features, we've extracted the meaningful information out of them and we don't require them anymore. Okay, so we can also create an artificial feature combining P class and age. Let's just see how that's done. So we have another feature which is age into class. We're making this feature in which we are multiplying the age with the P class. And to display its head, you can see that this is a feature that we have got. Up till now we have seen that how can we fill the missing values of a continuous feature but how can we do that with the categorical feature. So we saw earlier that Embarked has lots of missing values and its categories are basically S, Q and C. So let's just see that how can we deal with this missing feature. In our data set we saw that Embarked has basically two missing values so we are just going to fill them with the most common missing values. So we are taking the mode for Embarked where we don't have any null value and the frequently used category is S, so we are going to simply fill the null spaces with S. And then again we are going to see the survived mean amongst the category. So if a person has embarked from port C, then his survival chances are 0.5, from port Q is 0.389 and from port S is 0.339. How can we convert a categorical feature to numeric? So we can now convert the embarked feature by creating a new numeric port feature. So we are just giving the categories S0, C1 and Q is equals to 2. And now you can see that we have converted, we have mapped it to numeric values. We have another numeric feature that has lots of missing values similar to the age. So this feature is fair and uh, we are going to compute the median for this feature and we are going to replace the nulls with the median of this feature. So we are going to do this in a single line of code. Here is that line of code. Now you can see that we have replaced fair with the median value of fair. Similar to the age, we are going to use the qcut function over here. Previously used the cut function. Now we are going to use the qcut and we are going to make four bins for fair. And let me just display this answer. So here we have four bins and we have the respective mean of the survived according to which we are going to make the categories 
for the fair feature. Let's just run this code. Now you can see that the fair feature has been categorized and there are no null values in it. Moving on, we're going to see how can we select a model and how can that model help us predict the target output and solve our problem. So firstly, we are going to split our data into test and train. We have X train and Y train. In the X train, we are dropping the survived column and in Y train, we only have the survived column. In X test, we are dropping the passenger ID and then we are printing out all of their shapes. For X train, we have 891 rows and 8 columns and for Y train, we have 891 rows. For uh, X test, we have 418 rows and we have 8 columns. So let's just print out X train and you can see that these are the columns that we have and these are the values for those columns. First, we are using the logistic regression model and the code for this is very simple. We are using the logistic regression function and we are fitting the X train and Y train to this function and we are predicting our output values. Next, we are checking the accuracy for this model. So, we have a built-in function to check the score, accuracy score for this model and it's 80.36. Not bad at all. Now, let's just check the correlation for each of the feature with the target class and these are the correlations and we discussed in the conceptual study that the strongly correlated feature has a value greater than 0 and it's a positive value and the negative correlated has a negative value. So you can see that sex is a very strongly correlated feature. Next we are going to use the decision tree model for the prediction purpose. Here's, then again we are going to fit X train and Y train to a model and we are going to predict the result in Y predict and we are going to calculate its accuracy score that is 86.76. Similarly, we are going to do it for K nearest neighbor but here you see that we need to give the parameter of N which is that we want three nearest neighbors to be the parameter fitting the algorithm and checking the accuracy, it's 83.84. Now we're going to do it with linear regression. Linear regression, you see my accuracy score is 39.06, it's a very poor score. And lastly, we're going to see knife base. So you see the accuracy score is 72.28. Let's just visualize all of these scores on a graph so that we can get a better understanding of which model is actually better for us in this problem. So here we have all of the scores in all of the models in a tabulated form but since we have also seen that how can we visually represent our data so let's just do that and over here you can see that decision tree has the highest score after that we have KNN then logistic regression then comes knife base and lastly we have linear regression. So decision tree has outperformed all of the models in these cases. Thank you for watching this lab. In this module, we're going to discuss the evaluating techniques of a machine learning model. The problem with machine learning models is that you won't get to know how well a model performs until you test its performance on an independent data set, a data set which was not used for training the machine learning model. So we use some model evaluation techniques. The first model evaluation technique that is going to be discussed is cross-validation. In the machine learning, we couldn't fit the model on the training data and can't say that the model will work accurately for the real data. For this, we must assure that our model got the correct patterns from the data and it is not getting too much noise. For this purpose, we can use the cross-validation technique. Cross-validation helps you estimate the performance of your model. One type of cross-validation is the k-fold cross-validation. When you are given a machine learning problem, you will be given two types of data sets. Known data, which is the training data set, and unknown data, which is the test data set. In one round of cross-validation, you will have to divide your original training data set into two parts. Number one, cross-validation training set, and number two, cross-validation testing set 
or the validation set. You will train your machine learning model on the cross-validation training set and test the model's predictions against the validation set. You will get to know how accurate your machine learning model's predictions are when you compare the model's predictions on the validation set and the actual labels of the data points in the validation set. For reducing the variance, several rounds of cross-validation are performed by using different cross-validation training sets and cross-validation testing sets. The results from all rounds are averaged to estimate the accuracy of the machine learning model. K-fold cross-validation is a common type of cross-validation. Some steps of K-fold cross-validation are number 1. Partition of the original training data set into K equal subsets. Each subset is called a fold. Now suppose the names of the folds are F1, F2 and up to Fk. Now we loop through i is equals to 1 to K and we keep the fold Fi as the validation set keeping all the remaining K minus 1 folds in the cross validation training set. Model is trained by cross-validation training set and the accuracy is calculated by validating the predicted results against the validation set. Average accuracy of all iterations is the estimated accuracy. Now in the K-fold cross-validation method, all the entries in the original training data set are used for both training as well as validation. Also each entry is used for validation just once. Generally, the value of k is taken to be 10, but it is not a strict rule and k can take any value. After talking about the cross-validation model evaluation technique, we're going to talk about accuracy and precision. Both accuracy and precision hold extremely high importance when addressing model evaluation techniques, so let's discuss them. Accuracy is closeness of the measurements to a specific value, whereas precision is the closeness of the measurements to each other. In other words, accuracy describes the difference between the measurement and the part's actual value, while precision describes the variation you see when you measure the same part repeatedly with the same device. Let's take a look at the following confusion matrix. Can you tell what's the accuracy for this model? Now, according to the matrix in front of us, the values in the diagonals, that is actual negative and predicted negative and actual positive and predicted positive are the correct predictions. So the accuracy of this model is very, very high, which is 99.9%. But what if I mention that the positive over here is actually someone who is sick and carrying a virus that can spread very quickly? Well, you get the idea. The cost of having a misclassified actual positive or false negative is very high here. A true positive is an outcome where the model correctly predicts the positive class. Similarly, a true negative is an outcome where the model correctly predicts the negative class. A false positive is an outcome where the model incorrectly predicts the positive class. And a false negative is an outcome where the model incorrectly predicts the negative class. Now let's look at precision first. You can see the formula for calculation of precision on your screen. Immediately you can see that precision talks about how precise or accurate your model is out of those predicted positive and how many of them are actually positive. Precision is a good measure to determine when the costs of false positive is high. For instance, email spam detection. In email spam detection, a false positive means that an email that is non-spam, actual negative, has been identified as a spam, that is the predicted spam. The email user might lose important emails if the precision is not high for the spam detection model. Now let's see in the same context what is recall. The formula for its calculation is also on your screen. It actually calculates how many of the actual positives our model captures through labeling it as positive, that is true positive. Applying the same understanding, we know that recall shall be the model matrix we use to select our best model when there is a high cost associated with a false negative. 
For instance, in fraud detection, if a fraudulent transaction, which is actual positive, is predicted as non-fraudulent, that means predicted negative, the consequences can be very bad for the bank. Hi everyone, welcome to lab number 3 of our course and in this lab we are going to evaluate the models that we previously trained in lab number 2. We are going to begin off with logistic regression and the technique that we are going to use in order to evaluate it is cross validation. So I am going to explain you the code over here and this code is pretty much used in all of the remaining models. So we are going to go into the detail of the first block of code and then I assume that you probably have got a good understanding of it so that we can begin off with checking the outputs and comparing those outputs for rest of the models. So let's just get to it. Okay, so you can see over here that we have a variable which is kfold and we are calling the kfold method. So it's basically a method of the sklearn library and uh, it provides the train and test indices to split the data in train and test sets. So it splits the data into k consecutive folds and you can see some parameters that we have defined over here. Let's just discuss these. Firstly, we have n splits over here. So this is basically the number of folds and it must be at least 2 and over here we have assigned it the value 10. The second is a random state and we have declared that this is 22. It basically affects the ordering of your indices. So this line, it splits the data into 10 equal parts. Up next, we have cross val score. It's also a method of the sklearn library and uh, we are going to use this in order to evaluate a score by cross validation. So we are giving it an estimator, which is our trained model of logistic regression. So it's an object to use in order to fit the data. Next, we have an, sorry. Next, we have an array over here, which is all features. So this is the data to fit basically. And then we have the targeted feature. So this targeted feature is basically our target variable which we are trying to predict. So then we have CV10, which is basically cross validation folds 10 and the scoring technique or the scorer is accuracy. So we're basically printing the result over here. We're rounding it off. We're taking the mean for it and then we're rounding it off to two decimal place. Next we have cross val predict. So it generates a cross validate estimate for each input data point. So we have our estimator over here and then we have all of the features which is the data to fit and lastly we have the targeted feature and then we have cross validation which is set up to 10. And lastly we are going to plot a heat map and uh, we are going to plot it for the targeted features and for the predict value over here that we have found or got using the cross val predict. So let's just execute this and see the result. Okay, so we can see over here that the cross validated score for logistic regression is 80.24. And in terms of confusion matrix, we can see that the zeros correctly identified are 477. The ones which are correctly identified are 238. And the ones that are wrongly predicted are 104. And for the zeros, it's 72. So let's just use the same technique in order to evaluate the decision tree. The code is same except the fact that I've used decision tree instead of the estimator. So let's just execute this. And now you can see that the cross validated score for decision tree is 79.92. And in terms of confusion matrix, the zeros correctly predicted are 485. And the ones correctly predicted are 228, whereas the false predictions are 114 and 64. Now for KNN, the validated score comes out to be 78.46. Let me just make the slight change over here and turn this to KNN. 
let's just rerun this. So Yes, yeah, so the cross-validated score for KNN is 78.46 and this is the confusion matrix. These are correctly predicted and these are wrongly predicted. Now for naive base. The score is 71 and this is the result of the confusion matrix. So all of these are actually quite close to each other in terms of confusion matrix. So we have calculated the cross validation accuracies. Now let's just compare these. So I'm just rounding off them to their mean uh, and up to two decimal places. Let's just run this and now let's just see them in a tabulated form. So over here you can see that the cross validation accuracy score for logistic regression is 80.24, for decision tree it's 79, for KNN it's 78 and for knife base it's 71. So let's just plot this to get a better understanding and here is the plot. So earlier in the previous plot we saw that decision tree came out to be the best but now you can see that logistic regression proves out to be the best model and the best fit in order to predict more accurate results as compared to the others. So in order to rely on a deployable model for this problem statement that is prediction of the survivors, the logistic regression model has proven to be most suitable. The deployment of machine learning models is the process for making your models available in the production environment where they can provide predictions to other software systems. It is only once models are deployed to the production that they start adding value, making deployment is a crucial step. And we're going to discuss this in this module. Now that you are done with the process of machine learning model and the design process, so you have a good knowledge on working to generate your own machine learning model. The major part is to deploy the model you have created so that it can be used by the end users such that they can input some parameters, changing them and predicting the results they are looking for. So let's begin with the definition of what is model deployment. The practical process of machine learning deployment or the process which we say model deployment simply means is integration of a machine learning model into existing production environment where it can take some input parameters and return a predicted output. The purpose of deploying your model is to allow the end users to make the predictions from a trained machine learning model available to other systems existing in the network such as stocks prediction, real estate price estimation, and investment plans etc. For model deployment there are some criteria that the machine learning model needs to achieve before it's ready for the deployment phase. The criteria that should be met by our machine learning model before deployment is number one portability. This refers to the ability of the software to be transferred from one machine or system to another. A portable model is one with a relatively low response time and one that can be rewritten with minimal effort. The next one is scalability. This refers to how large your model can scale. A scalable model is the one that doesn't need to be redesigned to maintain its performance. Let's have a look at the high level architecture for machine learning. A machine learning modeling process carries four major layers. The first one is the data layer. The data layer provides access to all the data sources that the model requires. The second is the feature layer. This is responsible for generating feature data in a transparent, scalable and usable manner. Next third one is the scoring layer which is responsible to transform features into predictions. Scikit-learn is most commonly used here and is industry standard for scoring. And the last layer is evaluation layer. The evaluation layers 
check the equivalence of two models and can be used to monitor production models which means it is used to monitor and compare how closely the training predictions match the predictions on the input data. In general, there are three ways of deploying your machine learning model. First one is the one-off. It is not that the machine learning model needs to be trained continuously. Sometimes a model is only needed once or on a periodic basis. In such cases, the model can ad hocly be trained as per the requirement and move to the production till the time it degrades and requires attention to address the fixes. Next in is the batch training. This allows constant use of updated model versions having scalable capability which allows the use of sub-samples to train the model instead of using the complete data set. This is better if using a model on a consistent basis but doesn't require the real-time predictions. And third comes the real-time. In most of the cases, it is required to get a real-time prediction. Let's say we want to determine whether the transaction is fraudulent or not. So this can be done with the help of online machine learning models like linear regression using stochastic gradient descent. There are a few factors that need to be considered when determining the chosen method for deployment. Number one is how frequently predictions will be generated and how urgent the results are needed. Second is whether the prediction should be generated individually or by batches. And third is the latency requirement of the model, the computing power capabilities that one has. And lastly, the operational implications and the cost required to deploy and maintain the model. Hello everyone, now we are at the Capstone project and in this phase of our course, we are going to have an overview of all of the discussed concepts and we are going to apply them and see that how can we work around them. So the problem at hand that we have is Boston House price prediction. The first step is that we need to load the necessary libraries. So we have numpy, matplotlib, pyplot, pandas, seaborn, scipy.stats, sklearn and uh, rc params from matplotlib. So let's just import these. These have been successfully imported and now we are going to load our data set. So sklearn library contains a variety of pre-stored datasets and Boston House Prediction is one of this dataset. So we're going to load this from the library. So here is the code for that. So we have a variable Boston in which we're going to load this dataset. And let's just print out the keys for this dataset. So we have the data, we have target, we have feature names, we have description and the file name. Let's just print out the shape of the data and we have 506 rows and 13 columns. Now we are going to describe our data. Let's just go through this so we can get a better understanding of our data. So this is Boston House Prediction Dataset and the number of instances which is the number of rows is 506 and the number of attributes is 13 and this doesn't include the target. So this is the description for each of the column that we have. So we have crim which is the per capita crime rate by town. We have zn which is the proportion of residential land zoned for lots over 25,000 square feet. Indus is the proportion of non-retail business acres per town. Chas is Charles River dummy variable, which is one if the track bounds river and zero in the other case. Nox is the nitric oxides concentration. RM is the average number of rooms per dwelling. Age is the proportion of owner occupied units built prior to 1940. This is weighted distance to five Boston employment centers. RAD is the index of accessibility to radial highways. Tax is the full value property tax rate per $10,000. PT ratio is the pupil teacher ratio. B is uh, 
the proportions of blacks per town. Elstat is the percent lower status of the population and MEDV is the median value of owner-occupied homes in $1,000. So there are none missing attributes and uh, the creator of this data set is Harrison and Ruben Field. So we're going to use this data set for predicting the prices of Boston houses. Let's just see the feature names. So these are the tags for the feature names. And now we are going to convert the loaded data set that we have into data frame by applying the pandas library function. So PD is the alias for pandas library and we're calling its function dot frame and giving it the parameter, the data that we have already loaded and we're saving it in the Boston DF variable name. And lastly, we are going to see the head of this data frame. So here is the head. The thing to be noted over here is that we don't see the column names as yet. So they are tagged as 0, 1, 2, 3, whereas they should be given the names. Crim, ZN, Indus, Chas, and so on and so forth. So let's just do that. So over here, we're replacing the integers by the tags. So that is df. A Boston underscore df dot columns is equals to Boston dot features name and now let's just display the head. So here it is. It's been replaced. And now lastly, we're going to create an other column. The name of that column is going to be price and we're going to give it the value of Boston dot target. And you can see that it has been added. Let's just see the shape now. So now we have 14 columns instead of 13. Let's use the describe function to see the summary of each column. So this is the count, the mean, standard deviation, minimum value, 25% quartile, 50% quartile, 75% quartile, and the maximum numbers. Now we're going to find out the correlation between the features. For that, we are using the built-in function, which is core, and then we're going to see the shape. So the shape is 14 by 14. Now just let's just plot this on a heat map. It's just taking a little bit of time and we have it here. So you can see over here that we have uh, positively correlated features and some negatively correlated features. So you can see that with price, LSTAT is very, it's, it's strongly correlated but negatively. And similarly, RM is strongly correlated but this is a positive correlation. Now let's just look into further detail of correlation. So I'm using a pair plot over here. It's taking a bit of time. Here it is. Now uh, using this pair plot, we can see the distribution of the features with respect to price. So we can see that RM and um, tax, PT ratio and LSTAT. So these have a very strong relationship with price. So they're in good correlation. So we're going to focus on these. Let's just plot a graph that only has these four features. So we're going to short our data frame and then we're going to look into the correlation for these four with price. Let's just plot the heat map and now it's a bit more clear. So we can see that tax has a very strong correlation but negative correlation with price such as the case with PT ratio and LSTAT is even more strongly correlated but negatively. So we are missing on one feature which is here, yes. And RM, we can see that it is positively correlated, but it has a very strong correlation when it comes to price. So these are our features of interest. So here is the correlation in terms of matrix. So these are the values of correlation. Now let's just make a pair plot again. It's going to be a five cross five figure and it will help us understand the data in more detail and we'll see the distribution of data with the help of this pair plot. 
All right. So we can see that Rm and Lstat, they are normally distributed. Whereas in tax and in price, we do see some outliers as in over here and some here as this price is some of the prices are very high most of the prices lie somewhere here so we're going to see that how uh, we can handle these outliers as well okay so let's just describe our limited data set and here is the count mean standard deviation minimum and uh, 25 50 75 percent quartile and the maximum values for these four features and our target feature now we are going to understand the feature correlation let's just see the individual relationship of each feature with price starting with number of rooms which is rm so we are going to have a reg plot x contains x axis has the value rm y axis has the value price let's just execute this and we can see that there is a positive correlation that is with the increase in the number of rooms the price also increases and with the decrease in the number of rooms the price also decreases so there's a positive correlation amongst the two next we have lower status population which is lstat and now we can see that we have a negative correlation that is with the increase in lstat we have a decrease in price and vice versa so we have a negative correlation now let's just see tax and price so there's a direct correlation between tax and price that is when the price is more we can see that the taxes are more as well and lastly for PT ratio and price we see a sort of a negative correlation amongst the two features Moving on, we're going to have a univariate and multivariate analysis. For that, we're going to analyze the price first. We are going to analyze price using box plot and distribution plot. And here are both of our plots. So you can see that some extreme values on the left and some extreme on the right. These could be our potential outliers. And by the shape of the distribution plot, we can see that price is normally distributed. Now, using the prerequisite knowledge of outliers, we will observe these data points. And a potential outlier is one which is lesser than quartile 1 minus 1.5 into the interquartile range. And it is greater than quartile 3 plus 1.5 to interquartile range. So now let's just find out the values of these potential outliers that is we're going to find the price upper value and the lower values to these quartile ranges. So firstly we have the prices where we have a lower price range and these are our potential outliers which have a value less than quartile 1 minus 1.5 into the interquartile range. So we have few observations. You can see that lower the price, we have higher taxes. And uh, we can see that the tax 666, it is very high for a house having almost five rooms. So in conclusion, we can say that as both the tax and the LSAT, they are negatively correlated to price. This means that the higher the tax and the LSAT value, the lower will be the price so that means that both of these value they're of importance and we cannot just deduct them from our uh, data set so we cannot remove them and we need them as we will go forward same analysis will be applied for the upper value range of prices and here we can see that we have lots of higher prices of houses which is out of the ordinary higher values so we can see over here that having a house price which is high for instance over here we have lots of 50s 
and uh, the number of room they ranges from about five to nine so here you can see that they range from five up till nine so also for these houses the tax it ranges from low to very high so these are some low values and then again we have some highs so for house prices between 37 to less than 50 the room number is higher than 75 percent of the total data points and since rm is positively correlated to the price this can be a possible reason for the little higher house prices and also for these houses the pt ratio and the l stat lies in about 25 percent to 50 percent so these are both of these ratios since PT ratio and LSTAT are negatively correlated to price, this can be the reason for little higher house prices. So what can we conclude from this? So we can conclude that we will have to drop the data points for the houses that have prices equals to 50, but we'll keep the points between 37 to 49 as they don't have any unusual behavior. But the ones having a price is equals to 50 tend to have this behavior so they ought to be removed let's just remove those points and see what's the data frame before and after shape so firstly we have 509 rows but after removing the outliers where the house price is equals to 50 we have 490 rows now let's just analyze tax in the same manner as we did for the price so over here you can see that we have a box plot for tax and distribution of tax and lastly we are have made a scatter plot of tax versus the price the distribution of tax is not normal and in the box plot we can see that there are no outliers but instead there are some tax values that are way too high so from the scatter plot we see that these high tax values are for price values range from low to high now let's just see the shape where tax is greater than 600 so we have about 132 entries in which tax is greater than 600 that is mostly the value we saw came out to be 666 Okay, now let's just dive a little deeper and print the temporary data frame. So we have 132 rows and we have five columns. Let's just describe this data frame. So these are the count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, quartiles and the maximum value. So what can we observe from this description over here and the summary, we can say that RM ranges from about 3.56 to about 8.78 and for PT ratio we can see that the value is mostly 20.10 to 20.20 so that's pretty much 20.20 with a little variation. For LSTAT we can see that the range is from 5.29 to about 37.97 and for the price we see that we have the range about from 5 to about 29.80 so all of these observations they're quite unusual and it isn't possible to have such high tax values for all of these houses so these values are mostly like so these values most likely they were missing values and they were imputed casually by someone so the conclusion that we can make is that since LSTAT is most correlated to tax as seen above in the heat map, so we will replace those 132 tax values with the mean of the remaining tax values dividing in some intervals with the help of LSTAT. And the interval 1 which is tax 10 will replace the extreme tax values having LSTAT in between 0 to 10 with the mean of other tax values whose L stat is between 0 to 10 and the interval 2 which is tax 20 will replace the extreme tax values having an L stat which is between 10 to 20 with the mean of other tax values whose L stat is between 10 to 20. The next thing that we're going to do which is interval 3 is that we're going to replace the extreme tax values having L stat between 20 to 30 with mean of tax values which is between 20 to 
30 and similarly for the fourth interval. So all of those steps that I've mentioned have been coded over here. So let's just execute this and these have been successfully imputed. Now let's just see the count where tax is greater than 600, it comes out to be zero. So we have successfully replaced those values. And lastly, let's just see the shape of tax now. So tax you can see over here that now it's normally distributed and there's not much variation. So all of the values which were greater than 600, they have been imputed. Next, we are going to analyze the PT ratio. So you know the drill, we are going to have a box plot, a distribution plot and a scatter plot with respect to price. So over here we can see that PT ratio, it is normally distributed and there are few values which are to the extreme left. So these are some of the outliers that we can see with the help of a box plot. So let's just see what these values are. So here you can see that where the PT ratio is less than 14, these are the values. So these are the house prices, these are the RMs, and these are the tax values for these. So what do we observe? So the PT ratio for all of the above points is same. So that is with a little variation, we have some 12.6, but mostly we have 13s. And the RM and the price is increasing simultaneously as RM and the price, they are positively correlated. So the price is increasing and so is the RM. And lastly, we can say that the LSTAT increases, whereas the price decreases because there's a negative correlation amongst the two. So we don't observe any abnormalities, so we'll keep this data. And now we are going to analyze the LSTAT. So we're going to plot the three graphs and you can see that we do see some outliers over here, but the distribution is quite normal. But we can see that the LSAT is skewed towards the right. So there are some high LSTAT values and then we can see some lows as well. So uh, first we're going to calculate the outliers, the upper range for that. And you can see that these are the upper ranges or the upper values. So from these calculated values, we can observe that the prices of houses is actually low for a high LSTAT value, which represents the negative correlation. And for the RM value, we can see that it is low and the tax value is a little higher, which means that low price has the correlation which is negative with RM and it has a positive correlation with tax. So we don't see any abnormality over here so we will keep this data and now lastly we're going to observe RM. So firstly we're going to draft the box plot and distribution plot and the scatter plot and we can see that RM is normally distributed but there are some expected outliers on the left and on the right. So the scatter plot of RM versus the price shows a good positive linear relationship amongst the both. Let's just calculate the lower value for uh, the outliers. So here we can make an observation that in row number 365 and 367 we see that the house prices they are much higher as compared to other prices while the RM it is quite low though RM and the price they are positively correlated and also for these two data points tax and the PT ratio they are above 50% of data points respectively so um, both are negatively correlated with the price so for the rest data points we don't see any unusual behavior so what can we conclude from this observation is that the two points which are at row number 365 and 367, they may influence the prediction capability of our model. So we are going to keep the rest, but we are going to delete these. And after that, we're going to see the shape. So earlier we had 490 rows, but now we have around 488 rows. So we can see that there is a difference of shape after removing the outliers. Now let's just see for the upper values. 
So these are the upper values that we have. So in the above data points, we see that only one data point that is at row 364, it has a very low house price as compared to other house prices that we see here. So the RM, while it is very high at this point in time, so though RM and the price, they're positively correlated. So also for this data, the L stat is low and the price is also low. So both of these are negative correlated, but still we see this relationship amongst the both. And for the rest of the data points, there isn't any unusual behavior. So it's good to go but we're going to remove this last data point and after removing we're going to see the shape of our data so here we see that now we have around 487 points after removing the one point and we can see the difference between the shape and now we're done with the multivariate and the univariate analysis so let's just split our data into test and train so that we can train a model and check its accuracy and see that which model is best for prediction of house prices. So for that, first we're going to print out our data frame. So we have 487 rows and we have five columns and this includes our target column as well. So let's just remove actually drop the price column and we are going to include it in the variable y and the rest of the features are going to be in variable x now let's just see variable x so here is variable x now we have four features and in variable y we have this one feature which is of price let's just print out the shape for both so we have four columns in the first data frame and we have one column in the other Now we're going to split our data into train and test data. That is going to be with the help of sklearn library, which is train test split. So we, the test size that we're going to give is 0.3. So our split is going to be 30 to 70%. Let's just execute this. And now let's just see the shape of all of our data frames. So we have an X train, which contains 340 rows an X test which has 147 rows, a Y train which has 340 rows and a Y test which has 147 rows. Now we are going to train our model. We're going to use the logistic regression in order to train our model. So we've already seen that how we can apply logistic regression to the model. So we're using the fit function for that. We are giving it X train and Y train and then we are going to predict the result. And lastly, let's just plot it out on a graph so over here we can see the predicted values versus the original values this is on the test set so this is our y predict and this is our test so now we're going to calculate the accuracy and the accuracy is going to be measured using r square and the adjusted r square so these are basically the formulas for them and we are just going to execute this so the R square value comes out to be 0 0.749 and adjusted comes out to be 0 0.42. So it's pretty much about 0 0.74. That is the accuracy for our model. Now let's just train decision tree on the same data. So we are training a decision tree. And this is the array, this is the decision tree regressor that we have and then we have the array. Now let's just plot the predicted values and over here we can see the y predict and the y test for the decision tree regress regressor. Let's just calculate the accuracy for this. Similarly, we're going to calculate the r square and adjusted r square and this comes out to be much closer to the linear regression. So it's also 0 0.74. Um, so the round off is 0 0.74 for both of them. So let's just plot both of the model, the results for them. Okay, so as a result, we can see that for linear regression, we have the prediction of zeros is 0 0.7490071 percent is accurate and for decision tree at 0 0.748 so there is about 0 0.001 percent better 
accuracy we have for linear regression than for decision tree. Now for ones we can see that we have 0 0.742000, sorry it's 2002 and for decision tree at 0 0.740963 so then again with about 0.002 percent linear regression is better than decision tree so we can conclude that the r square and the adjusted r square values for linear regression is better than decision tree so therefore this model is better approach for the prediction of house prices of boston data set Thank you for watching this entire session and I hope that this helped you a lot in making your concepts clear.